The manorial economy of the Middle Ages, like the guild system of its towns, never came to social terms with ancient concepts of labor and techniques. Infused by Roman concepts of justice, Germanic tribalistic traditions existed for centuries in unresolved tension with the centralistic claims of materially weak monarchies and an ideologically suspect papacy. Forced back from its inland sea, Europe was buried in its huge forests, bogs and mountains, a victim of its own accursed invaders from the north and the east. Here, the manor became the social interregnum that cleared the ground for a new historic point of departure. From the 11th century onward, technics bolted forward with an energy that had not been seen since the Neolithic Revolution. In successive order, the use of windmills was followed by the horse collar, which made it possible to pull heavy ploughs and transport inland goods cheaply, striking advances in metallurgy and metallic tools, an imposing system of highly developed agriculture, a complex machine techniques based largely on wooden components, and a sophisticated version of the ancient water wheel that would have surprised the most informed Roman engineers. Yet, none of these technical innovations produced any decisive changes in medieval social relations, except for the Greek polis. The medieval towns were usually more democratic than the urban centers of antiquity, the agrarian system less mobilized and rationalized, the craft occupations more individualistic and democratically structured, we cannot account for this favorable constellation of socio-technical circumstances without noting that the state and its bureaucracies had reached an idea in the history of political centralization and bureaucratization. Until the emergence of nation-states in England, France and Spain between the 15th and 17th centuries, Europe was comparatively free of the despotisms and bureaucracies that coated the social life of Northern Africa, the Near East, and Asia. The one class to benefit most from the rising nation-state was the European bourgeoisie. Increasingly centralized monarchies and their growing bureaucratic minions imposed the king's peace on the inland trade routes of Europe the king's courts on local arbitrary systems of justice, the king's mint on the erratic metallic currency distributed by financial robber barons, the king's navy on nests of maritime pirates, and the king's armies on newly colonized markets. This structure even more than any appreciable advances in instrumental techniques, provided the basis for the next great system of labor mobilization, the factory. The modern origins of abstract labor are found not only in the market economy and its clearly defined monetary system of exchange ratios, but also in the English countryside. There, the factors, so-called, who carted raw materials and semi-finished fabrics to cottage workers, eventually brought them together under a single roof, a factory, to rationalize and intensify a fairly traditional body of techniques under the watchful eye of foremen and the icy stare of mean-spirited, heartless, and cunning industrial entrepreneurs. The early factory introduced no sweeping technical dispensation other than the abstraction, rationalization, and objectification of labor and its embodiment in human beings.
spinning, weaving, and dyeing were still performed with all the machines that cottagers had used in their own homes for generations. No engines or prime movers were added to this old ensemble until the machinery for spinning, weaving, and dyeing yarn were invented a century or so later. But the new techniques had supplanted the old, the techniques of supervision, with its heartless intensification of the labor process, its conscienceless introduction of fear and insecurity, and its debasing forms of supervisory behavior. Where the factors had brought products, not people, the factory brought people, not products. This reduction of labor from its embodiment in products into a capacity of people was decisive. It turned fairly autonomous individuals into totally administered products, and gave products an autonomy that made them seem like people. The animate quality that things acquired, qualities which Marx aptly called the fetishism of commodities, was purchased at the expense of the animate qualities of people. An underclass was being produced that was almost as inorganic as the factory in which it worked, and the tools it used. A transubstantiation of humanity itself, as was to have profound consequences for the legacy of domination, and the future of human freedom. Leaving aside the stupendous array of devices and prime movers that the factory was to commandeer in its service, its most important technical achievement has occurred. In the techniques of administration, no less important than its evolving technical armamentarium was the evolution of the joint stock company into the multinational corporation, and of the feisty, muscular foreman into the suave, multilingual corporate executive. Nor was the state to be spared its own change from a royal court with circuit judges. And ink-spotted scribes, into a stupendous bureaucratic population that, together with its military strong arm, formed a nation-state in its own right within the confines of the nation. The bureaucratic apparatus has underpinned overtly totalitarian monarchies, such as the Incas of Peru and pharaohs of Egypt, is dwarfed by the managerial. Civil and corporate bureaucracies of a single American, European, or Japanese commercial city. But no mere description of this development can pass for an explanation. Bureaucracy, conceived as an institutionalized technics in its own right, may well have its origins in the primordial world. I refer not merely to the internal dialectic of hierarchy, that yields a legacy of domination in the forms of gerontocracies, priestly corporations, patriarchy, and warrior chieftains. I am equally concerned with the civil sphere of the male, who produces rationalized ceremonial and military systems as compensatory mechanisms. For his own ambivalent status in organic society, he is necessarily less fulfilled in a domestic society, where woman forms the core of authentic social activity, than in civil society. But one that he must elaborate into a fully articulated and structured sphere of life. His very identity. Is at stake in a world where production and reproduction are centered around women, where the so-called magic of life inheres in her own life processes, where the rearing of the young, the organization of the home, and the fecundity of nature seem to be functions of her sexuality 
and personality. Whether he envies matricentricity or not is irrelevant. He must evolve an identity of his own, which may reach its most warped expression in warfare, arrogance, and subjugation. The male's identity does not have to find fulfillment in an orbit of domination, but where this does occur on a significant scale, it is fatal to the entire social environment. Not only is the community itself transformed by the elaboration of this civil sphere into a political, often militaristic one, the surrounding communities must also respond, either protectively or aggressively, to the rot developing within the social ecosystem. An apparently democratic, egalitarian, possibly matricentric culture, such as the Andean Nazca, would have been obliged to react aggressively to an authoritarian, hierarchical, patricentric, and militaristic culture such as the nearby Moche. Sooner or later, both would have had to confront each other as tyrannical chiefdoms, or the Nazca would have been compelled to defer to the Moche. Given sufficient exposure to external forces, a process of negative selection on the level of political life has always been at work to favour the expansion of ruthless cultures at the expense of the more equable ones. What is surprising about social development is not the emergence of new and old world despotisms, but their absence in large areas of the world generally. It is testimony to the benign power inherent in organic society that so many cultures did not follow the social route to statehood, mobilised labour, class distinctions and professional warfare. Indeed, that they retreated into remoter areas to spare themselves this destiny. Perhaps the most important ideological factor to foster the development of capitalism in European society was Christianity, with its strong emphasis on individuation, its high regard for the redemptive role of labour, its elevation of an abstract supernature over a concrete nature, and its denial of the importance of community as distinguished from the universal papal congregation. That individual initiative, even more than a high sense of individuality, promoted human will and inventiveness, hardly requires elaboration. The Thomas Edisons and Henry Fords of the world are not great individuals, but they are surely grasping egos, vulgar caricatures of the biblical angry men. The transformation of Yahweh's will into man's will is too obvious a temptation to be evaded. Even the church's ecclesiastics and missionaries, driven by their zealous fanaticism, are more transparently bourgeois men than mere Homeric heroes, who lived by the canons of a shame culture. This emphasis on the personal ego, with its voyaging sense of enterprise, was reinforced by Christianity's obsession with labour. Historically, the Church placed its highest stakes on faith rather than works, on contemplation rather than labour. But in practice, the medieval Christian orders were mundane working establishments which left a high imprint on the technologically undeveloped peasantry around them. Monasteries played a major role in innovating techniques and in rationalising labour. Indeed, they pioneered as missions, not only in the dissemination of faith, but in the dissemination of technical knowledge and planned, orderly systems of work. Here, they found a welcome response 
for there was no need to preach a gospel of work to highly impoverished agrarian communities that desperately needed the technical wisdom of knowledgeable and disciplined monastic orders. The work ethic, despite its ill repute today as a Calvinist trick, was not invented by the bourgeoisie or, for that matter, by pre-industrial ruling classes. Ironically, it can be traced back to the socially underprivileged themselves. The work ethic appears for the first time in Hesiod's Works and Days, a peasant Iliad of the 7th century before Christ, whose anti-heroic workaday title and tenor reflect the tribute the poor man pays to his poor life. For the first time in a written legacy, work, in contrast to valour, appears as an attribute of personal nobility and responsibility. The virtuous man who bends his neck to the yoke of toil occupies the centre of the poetic stage and enviously elbows out the aristocrat who lives off his labour. Thus, the poor men assemble the virtues as the attributes of toil, renunciation and husbandry, all the more to affirm their superiority over the privileged who enjoy lives of ease, gratification and pleasure. Later, the ruling classes will recognise how rich an ideological treasure trove the Hesiods have bestowed upon them. They too will extol the virtues of poverty for the meek, who will find treasure in heaven while the arrogant will pay in hell for their sinful heaven on earth. Hence, toil has its rewards for the Christian congregation, just as contemplation has its rewards for the Christian elect. These rewards, to be sure, remain rather vague. An ethereal, everlasting life that may well be more boring than the earthly one, an unceasing reverence for God, a world abstracted of the luscious concretes that render cocagne so superior to paradise. In the abstract supernature, Christianity already begins to spawn the vagaries of abstract matter and abstract labour. Yahweh is a nameless God. Nature is merely the epiphenomenon of his word. And even good works are in themselves less virtuous than the activity of working. The disassociation of working from works, of the abstract process of labouring from the concrete use values work produces, is savagely dystopian. The lingering concrete use values of things in a world that has largely reduced them to exchange values is the hidden romance buried within the warped life of the commodity. To deny them is to deny humanity's claim to the satisfactions and pleasures they are meant to bestow. An overly ascetic and rationalistic outlook is the counterpart of an overly hedonistic and instinctive one. But this denial is precisely the function of a theology that places the word before the deed, supernature before nature, and working before works. As to broad ideological matters, Christianity had fewer differences with Galileo than either of them realised. The Galilean universe of lifeless matter and perpetual motion differs very little in principle from the Christian view of nature as inherently meaningless without the illumination of a heavenly supernature. By Newton's time, one could read, even write, the Principia without feeling any sense of conflict between the church and the royal society. It was naivete and distrust that separated for so long such kindred outlooks as the Christian and the scientific. The true smoke of peace 
between them was finally inhaled not from the bowls of ritual Indian pipes, but from the belching smokestacks of modern industry. Finally, no religion assailed more earnestly the authenticity, intensity and meaningfulness of community affiliation than Christianity. The Stoic plea for a recognition of a universal humanitas entailed not a denial of one's loyalty to the community, but merely the individual's recognition of mystical affinity to the city of man. The Christian plea for a universal humanitas was actually more cunning. It shrewdly acknowledged the claims of the state, but tried to replace the community's claims with those of the city of God, notably the church. The church's jealousy toward the Christian's community loyalties was lethal. The religion demanded strict obedience to its clerical infrastructure. The notion of congregation implied that the clergy had priority over all communal claims upon persons. Indeed, over all relationships among persons other than those ordained by God, and over all codes of solidarity other than the laws of Deuteronomy and Christ's strictures to his disciples. Thus, the church lived in covert hostility with the community, just as the state could find no peace between the blood oath, even in its patriarchal form. Here, Industrial capitalism, like science before it, found a perfect fit between the bourgeois concept of citizenship and the Christian. The free-floating ego, divested of all community roots because its ideal of individuality and personality, became its ideal of individuality and personality. The masterless men that all previous societies had feared so intensely became the new image of the untrammeled, self-reliant entrepreneur and his counterpart in the uprooted, propertyless proletariat. We must recognise that this attempt to divest techniques of its community matrix, imparted to the spirit of technical innovation. If the true meaning of techne includes an ethical emphasis on limit, then this emphasis was valid only if there was a social agency to nourish and enforce the conception. To the extent the techne was thrown into opposition to the community, the word began to lose its original ethical connotations and become strictly instrumental. Once societal constraints based on ethics and communal institutions were demolished ideologically and physically, techniques could be released to follow no dictates other than private self-interest, profit, accumulation and the needs of a predatory market economy. The time-honoured limits that had contained techniques in a societal matrix disappeared and for the first time in history, techniques was free to follow its own development without any goals except those dictated by the market. The Romans replicated their small iron furnaces instead of enlarging them, not because they were technologically obtuse, but largely because the communities from which the Roman Imperium was formed held its instrumental and institutional techniques in check. To say that the Roman mind could not conceive of larger furnaces is simply to reveal that its technical imagination was formed by an artisan conception of the world, however grandiose its political imagination. This bifurcation of state and society, of the central political power and the community, is crucial to an understanding of the nature of a libertarian technology and the relationship of technology to freedom.
Organic society, while institutionally warped and tainted by pre-industrial civilizations, retained a high degree of vitality in the everyday lives of so-called ordinary people. The extended family still functioned as an attenuated form of the traditional clan, and often provided a highly viable substitute for it. Elders still enjoyed considerable social prestige, even after their political standing had diminished, and kinship ties were still fairly strong, if not decisive, in defining many strategic human relationships. Communal labour formed a conspicuous part of village enterprise, particularly in agriculture, where it was cemented by the need to share tools and cattle, to pool resources in periods of difficulty, and to foster a technical reciprocity without which many communities could not have survived major crises. One does not have to look for, as Marx put it, the possession of land in common, or an unalterable division of labour that served as a fixed plan and basis for action in India's villages, in order to know that under the tightly woven political carpet of the state was an active, subterranean social world based on consensus, ideological agreement, shared customs and the commonality of religious beliefs. These traits are found even where political despotisms tend to be highly invasive, and they often are highly marked by peasant attitudes towards labour. Their most striking feature is the extent to which any kind of communal toil, however onerous, can be transformed by the workers themselves into festive occasions that serve to reinforce community ties. In the hypothetical account of the work habits of Inca peasants, Mason surmises that, quote, Like all cooperative labour, it must have been a jovial and not an onerous occasion, with plenty of chicha beer, singing and bantering. The songs, perhaps in honour of the gods when working the church lands, or in praise of the emperor while engaged in state fields, were appropriate to the occasion. As soon as the fields of the gods were finished, the work was repeated on the government lands, and then the people were free to cultivate their own fields. There was a communal spirit of helpfulness, and if a man was called away on state business, such as military service, his neighbours quietly attended to his agricultural needs. End quote. To the extent that recent archaeological discoveries and research into current Andean labour customs throw any light on their work habits, Mason's account seems reasonably accurate beneath the massive structure of a highly despotic state that closely supervised its underclasses. The peasantry lived a distinctly separate and socially organic life of its own. Indeed, the Inca state implicitly acknowledged this covert immunity to its controls by punishing the community as a whole, if its individual members were guilty of certain infractions of state regulations. This practice is so universal and ancient that it recurs repeatedly throughout history. One of the most vivid accounts of how communal labour traditions and forms linger on into modern times, often transforming grueling toil into festive work, appears in Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Levin, Tolstoy's typical fictional counterpart, observes peasants haying on his sister's estate. Sitting transfixed on the haycock, he is fascinated while teeming peasants in the meadow buoyantly cut the hay, stack it and pitch it with hay forks on wooden carts. Quote, Before him on the bend of the river behind the marsh moved a gaily coloured line of peasant women, chattering loudly and merrily, while the scattered hay was rapidly rising into grey zigzag ridges on a pale green stubble. End quote. The men follow the women with their hay forks until the haying is almost complete, 
The dialogue that ensues is inimitable. Quote, Make hay while the sun shines, and the hay you'll get will be lovely, said the old beekeeper, squatting down beside Levin. What lovely hay, sir? Tea? Not hay. Look, sir, at the way we pick them up. Like scattering grain to the ducks, he added, pointing to the growing haycocks. End quote. The work, in fact, is nearly done, and the beekeepers call out to his son, who responds. Quote, the last one, Dad, shouted the young man, reining in a horse and smiling, looking around at a cheerful, rosy-cheeked peasant woman who was driving by, standing on the front part of a cart, flicking the ends of his rempen reins. Flicking the ends of his hempen reins. End quote. It is tempting to focus our descriptions of technology and our accounts of technological innovation on the large-scale works of mobilized labor favored by early states and ruling elites. The achievements of power, its temples, mortuaries and palaces, evoke our ingrained awe of power. The hydraulic system of great alluvial empires like the Egyptian, Mesopotamian and Asian and the cities, roads, and megalithic structures of pre-Columbian America cast a long shadow over history. Tragically, this shadow has largely obscured the techniques of peasants and artisans at the base of society. Their widespread networks of villages and small towns, their patchwork farms and household gardens, their small enterprises, their markets organized around barter, their highly mutualistic work systems, their keen sense of sociality, and their delightfully individuated crafts, mixed gardens, and local resources that provided the real sustenance and artwork of ordinary people. A complete history of technology, food cultivation, and art has yet to be written from the standpoint of the so-called commoners, just as has a complete history of women, ethnic minorities, and the oppressed generally. In some cases, as we now know, even large political empires, like the Hittite Empire, were based overwhelmingly on small farms. Typically, these were worked by five or six people, using perhaps two oxen, and the cultivable land was divided into mixed croplands, vineyards, orchards, and pastures, that rarely supported more than small flocks of goats and sheep. In the Imperial Roman times, yeoman farms that lingered on from the early Republican era coexisted with immense latifundia, worked by thousands of slaves. The beautifully terraced slopes that marked agricultural belts from Indonesia to Peru were worked not merely for the state, but often segregated from state-owned lands for the needs of the extended family and local community. If Chinese corvi labor in the Sui dynasty, circa 600 AD, may have exceeded 5 million commoners who were under a guard of 50,000 troops, the great majority of the peasantry continued to work its own plots, cultivating mixed crops and orchards, and raising domestic animals. Even Aztec agriculture, despite the highly despotic militaristic state that governed central Mexico, was organized primarily around clan-type horticulture. Notably, the lovely floating or Chinapa gardens that lined and infiltrated the shallows of the Lake of Mexico. Viewed at its agrarian base, medieval Europe may well represent the apotheosis of the small, agriculturally mixed farm within the social framework of class society. The famous open field system, with its rotation of fallow and cultivated croplands, was organized around individually farmed narrow strips, but strip farming necessarily involved such close coordination of planting and harvesting between cultivators of adjacent strips that the peasantry normally shared its ploughs, draught animals and implements 
Not uncommonly, periodic redistributions of the strips were made to meet the material needs of larger families. Carried to the village level, these farming techniques fostered free peasant assemblies, a lively sense of reciprocity, and the reinforcement of archaic communal traditions, such as the use of uncultivable land for commons, to pasture animals, and to collect wood for fuel and construction materials. The manorial economy of the territorial lords by no means dominated this increasingly libertarian village society. Rather, it retained only a loosening hold over the artisan and commercial towns nearby. In later years, the villages and towns in many areas of Europe, thoroughly schooled in the practice of self-management, gained supremacy over the local barons and ecclesiastics, particularly in Switzerland and the Lowlands, but to a very great extent throughout Western Europe. Villages and towns established fairly powerful, often long-lived peasant federal republics and strong urban confederations. The new, comparatively libertarian institutional techniques spawned by this fascinating world yielded, in turn, an equally remarkable elaboration of a human-scale, comparatively libertarian instrumental techniques. Aside from the water mills already in abundance throughout Europe, William the Conqueror's Doomsday Book lists some 5,500 in about 3,000 English villages in 1086 AD. There were also windmills. Apparently derived from the ritual Tibetan prayer wheels, they had become so numerous by the 13th century that the Belgian towns of Ypres alone could celebrate the fact that it had reared 120 windmills in its environs. Even more striking is the extraordinary, unprecedented variety of uses to which European water wheels and windmills were put. This multipurpose character of medieval prime movers stunningly illustrates the extent to which unity in diversity is a correlate of ecological techniques. Water mills, known as early as Greek times, had been used almost exclusively to mill grain. Windmills, already in use in Persia as early as the 8th century, had probably been confined to the same limited uses. By contrast, the lively, alert and increasingly individuated town and country people of the High and Late Middle Ages deployed these new prime movers not only for restricted agricultural purposes, but also to raise and trip ensembles of heavy hammers in forges, to operate laves, to work bellows in blast furnaces, and to turn grindstones for polishing materials, as well as grinding grains. The new interest in machinery, as yet small in scale and fairly simple in design, led to a highly variegated use of cams, cranks and pumps, and of an indigenous combination of gears, levers and pulleys. It also fostered the triumphal invention of the mechanical clock, which lessened the need for arduous toil and greatly increased the effectiveness of craft production. What is highly attractive about the new vitality that appeared in medieval techniques is not simply the sense of innovation characterising its development. Rather, it is the sense of elaboration that marked the adaptation of the new to the social conditions of the old. Contrary to popular images that read our own values back into the medieval world, the technical utopians of that time were far removed in spirit and outlook from the technocratic utopians or futurists of the present era. Roger Bacon, the 13th century Franciscan, predicted large, highly powered ships steered by a single operator 
flying machines, and wagons that will travel at considerable speed by their own motive power. Figures like Bacon were not prescient engineers of an era to come. They were primarily theologians rather than technicians, alchemists rather than scientists, and scholastics rather than craftsmen. They bore witness more to supernatural powers than to human ingenuity. Some three centuries were to pass before authentic inventors like Leonardo da Vinci secretly sketched their cryptic designs and wrote their notes in a script that could only be read by using a mirror. Technics in Bacon's time was deeply embedded in, and its development constrained by, a richly communal social matrix that fostered an organic epistemology of design, an aesthetic use of materials, an elaboration of an adaptive technics, a deep respect for diversity, and a strong emphasis on quality, skill, and artfulness. These instrumental norms reflected the social norms of the time. Town and country were much too close to each other to render socially and intellectually acceptable the geometric temples, the urban gigantism, the inorganic social relations, and the deadening images of a mechanical world. However much the church emphasized heavenly supernature over earthly nature, the world of nature came increasingly to be seen as a gift of a heavenly dispensation. A sensibility that found its theological voice in the ideas of St. Francis. Work and the high premium placed on skills were much too individuated to make large masses of peasants and masterless men amenable to the mobilised labour systems of earlier eras. To the extent that we can think in terms of sizable masses of people, we must think more in terms of ideological crusades rather than of highly controlled labour forces. Owing to its decentralised character and its Christian sense of individual worth, medieval society was simply not capable of utilising, much less mobilising, huge numbers of commoners to monumentalise itself in public works. For all the abuses of feudal society, corvy labour was confined to the maintenance of public roads and tenant-type systems of food cultivation for the manorial lords. To defensive structures that were needed by the community, as well as the barons and to miscellaneous gifts of labour to the nobility and church. Technics itself tended to follow an age-old tradition of nestling closely into a local ecosystem, of adapting itself sensitively to local resources and their unique capacity to sustain life. Accordingly, it functioned as a highly specific catalyst between the people of an area and their environment. The rich knowledge of habitat, of region, local flora and fauna, soil conditions, even geology, that enabled people like the Bushmen or San to provision themselves in, as it seemed to Victorian Europe, an utter desert wasteland, survived well beyond primordial times into the European Middle Ages. This high sense of the hidden natural wealth of a habitat, a knowledge that has been so completely lost to modern humanity, kept the latent exploitative powers of techniques well within the institutional, moral and mutualistic boundaries of the local community. People did more than just live with the biotic potentialities of their ecosystem and remake it with an extraordinary sensitivity that fostered ecological diversity and fecundity. They also often artistically absorbed technically unique devices into this broad social matrix and brought them into the service of their locality. Only modern capitalism could seriously subvert this ancient sensibility and system of technical integration. And it did so not simply by replacing one instrumental ensemble by another. We we'll gravely mistake capitalism's 
historically destructive role if we fail to see that it subverted a more fundamental dimension of the traditional social ensemble, the integrity of the human community. Once the market relationship and its reduction of individual relationships to those of buyers and sellers replaced the extended family, the guild, and its highly mutualistic network of consociation, once home and the place of production became separate, even antagonistic, arenas, dividing agriculture against craft and craft against factory. Finally, once town and country were thrown into harsh opposition to each other. Then, every organic and humanistic refuge from a highly mechanised and rationalised world became colonised by a monadic, impersonal and alienated nexus of relationships. Community as such began to disappear. Capitalism invaded and undermined arenas of social life that none of the great empires of the past could ever penetrate or even hope to absorb. Not only was the technical imagination savagely dismembered, but also the human imagination. The cry, imagination to power, became a plea not only for a free play of fancy, but also for a rediscovery of the very power to fantasise. Whether its advocates recognised it or not. The urge to bring imagination to power implied a restoration of the power of imagination itself. The recent emphasis on limits to growth and appropriate technology is riddled by the same ambiguities that have imparted a conflicting sense of promise and fear to high technology. I have said enough about the danger of disassociating instrumental techniques, soft or hard, from institutional techniques. I leave the elaboration of their integration to the closing, more reconstructive chapter of this book, where I shall explore the possible structures of freedom, of human relationships, and of personal subjectivity that delineate an appropriate social matrix for libertarian techniques. For the present, however, I must emphasise again that terms like small, soft, intermediate, convivial and appropriate remain utterly vacuous adjectives unless they are radically integrated with emancipatory social structures and communitarian goals. Technology and freedom do not coexist with each other as two separate realms of life. Technology and freedom do not coexist with each other as two separate realms of life. Either techniques is used to reinforce the larger social tendencies that render human consociation technocratic and authoritarian, or else a libertarian society must be created that can absorb techniques into a constellation of emancipatory human and ecological relationships. A small, soft, intermediate, convivial or appropriate technical design will no more transform an authoritarian society into an ecological one than will a reduction in the realm of necessity of the working week enhance or enlarge the realm of freedom. In addition to subverting the integrity of the human community, capitalism has tainted the classical notion of living well by fostering an irrational dread of material scarcity, by establishing quantitative criteria for the good life. It has dissolved the ethical implications of limit. This ethical lacuna raises a specifically technical problematic for our time. In equating living well with living affluently, capitalism has made it extremely difficult to demonstrate that freedom is more closely identified with personal autonomy than with affluence, with empowerment over life 
than with empowerment over things, with the emotional security that derives from a nourishing community life, than with a material security that derives from the myth of a nature dominated by an all-mastering technology. A radical social ecology cannot close its eyes to this new technological problematic. Over the past two centuries, almost every serious movement for social change has been confronted with the need to demonstrate that techniques, hard or soft, can more than meet the material needs of humanity without placing arbitrary limits upon a modestly sensible consumption of goods. The terms of the black redistribution, so-called, have been historically altered. We are faced with the problems not of disaccumulation, but of rational systems of production. Post-scarcity, as I have emphasized in earlier works, does not mean mindless affluence. Rather, it means a sufficiency of technical development that leaves individuals free to select their needs autonomously and to obtain the means to satisfy them. The existing techniques of the Western world, in principle, a techniques that can be applied to the world at large, can render more than a sufficiency of goods to meet everyone's reasonable needs. Fortunately, an ample literature has already appeared to demonstrate that no one need be denied adequate food, clothing, shelter, and all the amenities of life. The astringent arguments for limits to growth and the lifeboat ethic, so prevalent today, have been reared largely on specious data and a cunning adaptation of resource problems to the institutional techniques of an increasingly authoritarian state. It is social ecology's crucial responsibility to demystify the tradition of a stingy nature, as well as the more recent image of high technology as an unrelieved evil. Even more emphatically, social ecology must demonstrate that modern systems of production, distribution and promotion of goods and needs are grossly irrational as well as anti-ecological. Whosoever sidesteps the conflicting alternatives between a potentially bountiful nature and an exploitative use of techniques serves merely as an apologist for the prevailing irrationality. Certainly, no ethical argument in itself will ever persuade the denied and the underprivileged that they must abdicate any claim to the relative affluence of capitalism. What must be demonstrated, and not merely on theoretical or statistical grounds alone, is that this affluence can ultimately be made available to all but should be desirable to none. It is a betrayal of the entire message of social ecology to ask the world's poor to deny themselves access to the necessities of life on grounds that involve long-range problems of ecological dislocation, the shortcomings of high technology, and very specious claims of natural shortages in materials while saying nothing, at all, about the artificial scarcity engineered by corporate capitalism. Anything that is not renewable is exhaustible. This is a Philistine truism. But confronted by such truisms, one may reasonably ask, when will it be exhausted? How? By whom? And for what reason? For the present, there can be no serious claim that any major, irreplaceable resource will be exhausted until humanity can choose new alternatives. New, referring not simply to material or technical alternatives, but above all to institutional and social ones 
the task of advancing humanity's right to choose from among alternatives, particularly institutional ones, that may yet offer us a rational, humanistic and ecological trajectory, has not yet been fulfilled by high or by low technology. In sum, high technology must be used by serious social ecologists to demonstrate that, on rational grounds, it is less desirable than ecological technologies. High technology must be permitted to exhaust its specious claims as the token of social progress, so-called, and human well-being. All the more to render the development of ecological alternatives a matter of choice rather than the product of a cynical necessity, so-called. Still another issue that may well be regarded as a new technological problematic is the association of the realm of freedom with free time, the political counterpart of Marx's abstract labour or labour time. Here, too, we encounter a tyrannical abstraction. The notion that freedom itself is a res temporalis, a temporal thing. The res temporalis of free time, like the res extensa of irreducible matter, is dead. The dead time from which the Parisian students of May to June 1968 sought freedom by translating time itself into the process of being free. Viewed from this standpoint, free time is very concrete time, indeed, a very active, socially articulated form of time. It entails not only freedom from the constraints of labour time, from the time clock imposed by abstract labour on the realm of necessity, or what we so felicitously call mindless production. It also entails the use of time to be free. If only in reaction to the deadening time constraints of abstract labour, the ideal of free time is still tainted by a wayward utopianism that exaggerates the power of use values over the tyranny of exchange values. Free time is still seen as inactivity on the one hand, and material plenitude on the other. Hence, freedom is still conceived as freedom from labour, not freedom for work. Here we encounter the aimless interests of the isolated ego, the rootless, libertarian monad that wanders waywardly through life as the counterpart of the wayward, rootless bourgeois monad. The workers in Anu la Liberté, René Clair's playful French utopia, so-called, of the early 1930s, achieve their freedom in a highly industrialised land of Cocagne. Their functions are taken over completely by machines while they do nothing but frolic in nearby fields and fish en masse along riverbanks that have an uncanny resemblance to their assembly lines. This is characteristically very modern. Claire's hobos, the principal characters of the motion picture, leave the tramp's version of freedom imprinted on the conclusion of the cinematic utopia. They are the masterless men of the 20th century who have yet to be formed into citizens of a community like the rootless, wandering radicals of the new left who carried their community, so-called, in their knapsacks or under the roofs of their trucks. The so-called utopia is charming but aimless, spontaneous but unformed, easygoing but structureless, poetic but irresponsible. One may live long in such a utopia, but not live well. The Hellenic ideal of freedom, an ideal confined to the citizen, was different. Freedom existed for activity, not from activity. activity.
It was not a realm, but a practice. The practice of being free by participating in free institutions, by daily recreating, elaborating, and fostering the activity of being free. One was not merely free in a passive sense of freedom from constraint, but in the active sense of free-ing, both of oneself and one's fellow citizens. An authentic community is not merely a structural constellation of human beings, but rather the practice of communizing. Hence, freedom in the polis was a constellation of relationships that was continually in the process of reproduction. According to Fustil de Coulange, quote, We are astonished at the amount of labour which this democracy required of men. It was a very laborious government. See how the life of an Athenian is passed. One day he is called to the assembly of his deem, and has to deliberate on the religious and political interests of this little association. Another day he must go to the assembly of his tribe. A religious festival is to be arranged, or expenses are to be examined, or decrees passed, or chiefs and judges named. Three times a month, regularly, he takes part in the general assembly of the people, and is not permitted to be absent. The session is long. He does not go there simply to vote. Having arrived in the morning, he must remain till a late hour and listen to the orators. He cannot vote unless he has been present from the opening of the session, and has heard all the speeches. For him, this vote is one of the most serious affairs. At one time, political and military chiefs are to be elected. This is to say, those to whom his interests and his life are to be confided for a year. At another, a tax is to be imposed or a law to be changed. Again, he has to vote on questions of war, knowing well that, in case of war, he must give his own blood or that of his son. Individual interests are separably united with those of the state. Red polis. A man cannot be indifferent or inconsiderate. If he is mistaken, he knows that he shall soon suffer for it, and that in each vote he pledges his fortune and his life. End quote. To recover the substantive, richly articulated attributes of freedom for, rather than merely freedom from, I am obliged to speculate about the attributes of a new society that would transmute busyness into the process of reproducing freedom on an ever-enlarging scale. Yet, we may reasonably ask whether technics, as a form of social metabolism, has certain formal attributes, its social matrix aside for the present, that can nourish social freedom as a daily activity. How can the design imagination foster a revitalization of human relationships and humanity's relationship with nature? How can it lift the muteness of nature, a problematical concept that we, in fact, have imposed on ourselves by opening our own ears to its voice? How can it add a sense of haunting symbiosis to the common productive activity of human and natural beings, a sense of participation in the archetypical animateness of nature? We share a common organic ancestry with all that lives on this planet. It infiltrates those levels of our bodies that somehow make contact with the existing primordial forms from which we may originally have derived. Beyond any structural considerations, we are faced with the need to give an ecological meaning to these buried sensibilities. In the case of our design strategies, 
we may well want to enhance natural diversity, integration, and function, if only to reach more deeply into a world that has been systematically educated out of our bodies and innate experiences. Today, even in alternate technology, our design imagination is often utilitarian, economistic, and blind to a vast area of experience that surrounds us. A solar house that symbolizes a designer's ability to diminish energy costs may be a monument to financial cunning, but it is as blind and deadened ecologically as cheap plumbing. It may be a sound investment, even an environmental desideratum, because of its capacity to use renewable resources, so-called, but it still deals with nature merely as natural resources, and exhibits the sensitivity of a concerned engineer, not an ecologically sensitive individual. An attractive organic garden may well be a wise nutritional investment over the quality of food obtainable in a shopping mall, but insofar as the food cultivator is preoccupied only with the nutritional value of food on a dinner table, organic gardening becomes a mere technical stratagem for so-called food-wise consumption, not a testament to a once hallowed intercourse with nature. All too often, we are flippantly prepared to use hydroponic trays as substitutes for actual gardens and gravel for soil. Since the object is to fill the domestic larder with vegetation, it often seems to make no difference whether our gardening techniques produce soil or not. Such commonplace attitudes are very revealing. They indicate that we have forgotten how to be organisms, and that we have lost any sense of belonging to the natural community around us, however much it has been modified by society. In a modern design imagination, this loss is revealed in the fact that we tend to design sculptures instead of ensembles. An isolated solar house here, a windmill there, an organic garden elsewhere. The boundaries between the so-called organic world we have contrived and the real one that may exist beyond them are strict and precise. If our works tend to define our identity, as Marx claimed, perhaps the first step in acquiring an ecological identity would be to design our sculptures as part of ensembles, as technical ecosystems that interpenetrate with the natural ones in which they are located, not merely as agglomerations of small, soft, intermediate or convivial gadgets. The principal message of an ecological technics is that it is integrated to create a highly interactive, animate and inanimate constellation in which every component forms a supportive part of the whole. The fish tanks, sun tubes and ponds that use fish wastes to nourish the plant's nutriment on which they live are merely the simplest examples of a wide-ranging ecological system composed of a large variety of biota, from the simplest plants to sizable mammals, that have been sensitively integrated into a biotechnical ecosystem. To this system, humanity owes not only its labour, imagination and tools, but its wastes as well. No less important than the ensemble is the technical imagination that assembles it. To think ecologically for design purposes is to think of technics as an ecosystem, not merely as cost-effective devices based on renewable resources. Indeed, to think ecologically is to include nature's labour in the technical process, not only humanity's.
the use of organic systems to replace machines wherever possible, say, in producing fertilizer, filtering out sewage, heating greenhouses, providing shade, recycling wastes and the like, is a desideratum in itself. But their economic wisdom aside, these systems also sensitize the mind and spirit to nature's own powers of generation. We become aware that nature, too, has its own complex economy, so-called, and its own thrust toward ever greater diversity and complexity. We regain a new sense of communication of an entire biotic world that inorganic machines have blocked from our vision. As production itself has often been compared with a drama, we should remember that nature's role is more than a mere chorus. Nature is one of its principal players and at times, perhaps, the greater part of the cast. Hence, an ecologically oriented technical imagination must seek to discover the way of things as ensembles, to sense the subjectivity of what we so icily call natural resources, to respect the attunement that should exist between the human community and the ecosystem in which it is rooted. The imagination must seek not merely a means of resolving the contradictions between town and country, a machine and its materials, or the functional utility of a device and its impact on its natural environment. I must try to achieve their artistic, richly coloured and highly articulated integration. Labour, perhaps even more than techniques, must recover its own creative voice. Its abstract form its deployment in the framework of linear time as a res temporalis, its cruel objectification as mere homogeneous energy, must yield to the concreteness of skill, to the festiveness of communal activity, to a recognition of its own subjectivity. In this broad revitalization of the natural environment, of work and of techniques, it would be impossible for the technical imagination to confine itself to the traditional imagery of a lifeless, irreducible and passive material substrate. We must close the disjunction between an orderly world that lends itself to rational interpretation and the subjectivity that is needed to give it meaning. The technical imagination must see matter not as a passive substance in random motion, but as an active substance that is forever developing, a striving substrate, to use an unsatisfactory word, that repeatedly interacts with itself and its more complex forms to yield variegated, sensitive and meaningful patterns. Only when our technical imagination begins to take this appropriate form will we ever begin to attain the rudiments of a more appropriate, or better, a liberatory, technology. The best designs of solar collectors, windmills and watermills, gardens, greenhouses, bio-shelters, biological machines, tree culture and solar villages will be little more than new designs rather than new meanings, however well-intentioned their designers they will be admirable artefacts rather than artistic works. Like framed portraits, they will be set off from the rest of the world, indeed set off from the very bodies from which they have been beheaded. Nor will they challenge in any significant way the systems of hierarchy and domination that originally reared the mythology of a nature dominated by one of its own creations. Like flowers in a dreary wasteland, they will provide the colours and scents that obscure a clear and honest vision of the ugliness around us, the putrescent regression to an increasingly elemental and inorganic world that will no longer be habitable for complex forms of life 
and ecological ensembles. Chapter 11 The Ambiguities of Freedom The techniques and the technical imagination that can nourish the development of a free, ecological society are beset by ambiguities. Tools and machines can be used either to foster a total domineering attitude toward nature or to promote natural variety and non-hierarchical social relationships. Although what is big in techniques may be very ugly, what is small is not necessarily beautiful. Great despotisms have been based on a technology that is Neolithic in scale and form. The criticism of industrial society and technological man, which erupted in the 1970s, is testimony to popular disenchantment with the hopes of earlier generations for growing technological development and the freedom it was expected to yield. A freedom based on material plenty and the absence of debasing toil. Perhaps less obviously, the same ambiguities also becloud our attitudes toward reason and science, as embodied in mathematics and Newtonian physics, were latent with the hope of a human mind freed of superstition and a nature freed of scholastic metaphysics. Voltaire's famous cry against the church, Ecrase l'infâme, was evidence of the Enlightenment's belief in the triumph of human mind as much as it was an attack upon clerical dogmatism. Alexander Pope's luminescent panegyric to Newton was as much evidence of a new belief in the intellectual clarity that science would impart to humanity's understanding of the cosmos as it was a tribute to the genius of Newton himself. These three great pathways, or tools, to use the language of modern instrumentalism, for achieving human freedom, reason, science and techniques, that seemed so assured merely a generation ago, no longer enjoy their high status. Since the middle of the 20th century, we have seen reason become rationalism, a cold logic for the sophisticated manipulation of human beings and nature. Science become scientism, an ideology for viewing the world as an ethically neutral, essentially mechanical body to be manipulated. And techniques become modern technology, an armamentarium of vastly powerful instruments for asserting the authority of a technically trained, largely bureaucratic elite. These means for rescuing freedom from the clutches of a clerical and mystified world have revealed a dark side that now threatens to impede freedom, indeed to eliminate the very prospects of reason, science and techniques once advanced for a free society and for free human minds. Rationalization. The ambiguity created by this Janus faced development of reason, science, and techniques leads to an all pervasive sense that this triune is meaningless as such, unless the three are re evaluated 
and restructured so that each one's latent liberatory side is rescued and its oppressive side clearly revealed. To return to irrationality, superstition and material primitivism is no more desirable than to defer to the value-free and elitist rationalism, scientism and technocratic sensibilities that prevail today. The need to rescue reason as an ethically charged logos of the world does not conflict with its use as a logic for dealing with that world. The need to rescue science as a systematic interpretation of that logos does not conflict with a recognition of the need for analytical techniques and empirical evidence. Finally, the need to rescue techniques as a means of mediating our relationship with nature, including human nature, does not conflict with humanity's own right to intervene in the natural world, to do even better than blind nature for fostering variety and natural fecundity. All these seemingly contradictory, ambiguous pathways for attaining freedom are essential to our very definition of freedom. Our ability to resolve these ambiguities of freedom depends as much on how we define reason, science and techniques as it does on how we use them. Ultimately, the paradoxes we encounter in defining reason, science and techniques cannot be resolved by a mystical formula that merely vaporizes the issues they raise. Their resolution depends upon a supreme act of human consciousness. We need to surmount the evil that lies in every good, to redeem the gain that inheres in every loss, be it the sociality latent in the solidarity of kinship, the rationality in primal innocence, the ideals in social conflict, the willfulness in patriarchy, the personality in individualism, the sense of humanity in the parochial tribal community, the ecological sensibility in nature idolatry, or the techniques in shamanistic manipulation. To redeem these desiderata without completely shedding certain features of the context that gave them viability, solidarity, innocence, tradition, community and nature, will require all the wisdom and artfulness we possess. Nor can they be adequately redeemed within the present social order. Rather, we need a new kind of imagination, a new sense of social fantasy, to transmute these often oppressive archaic contexts into emancipatory ones. In dealing with the ambiguities of freedom, I shall begin with reason, for reason has always formed the secular hallmark of every specifically human achievement. Presumably, it is by virtue of our rationality that we are unique in the mute world around us and can achieve our so-called mastery over it. The Enlightenment's generous commitment to reason, its vast faith in the human enterprise as the outcome of thought and education, has never been lost, even on its most severe critics, nearly all of whom have deployed reason in the very act of denigrating it.
William Blake's Assault on the Meddling Intellect is a brilliantly conceived intellectual tour de force, as was Rousseau's a generation or so earlier. My own arguments in defence of reason's integrity are not meant to be ad hominem, like a mocking incubus. Linear thought abides within the most mystical experiences and the most inspired forms of illumination. The role assigned to reason and the destiny imparted to it, whether as blessing or as curse, depends crucially on how we define it in the various lives or stages of society. Its role also depends on what, in our sensitivity to the world that surrounds and infuses us, reason is permitted to displace. Every serious critique of reason has focused on its historic instrumentalization into techniques, its deployment as a tool or formal device for classification, analysis and manipulation. In this sense, formal reason has never really been absent from the human enterprise. To anyone who has even an elementary familiarity with the tribal world, formal reason was simply a subdued presence in a larger sensibility, justly called subjectivity. But subjectivity is not congruent with consciousness. It speaks to a wider and deeper level of interaction with the world than to the mere capacity to classify, analyse, manipulate, or even to develop an awareness of self that is distinguishable from that of otherness. Critics of irrationality do not clarify these distinctions by wantonly banishing every subjective experience other than linear thought to the realm of the irrational or anti-rational. Fantasy, art, imagination, illumination, intuition and inspiration all are realities in their own right that may well involve bodily responses at levels that have been meticulously closed off to human sensibility by formal canons of thought. This blindness to large areas of experience is not merely the product of formal education. It is the result of an unrelenting training that begins at infancy and carries through the entire length of a lifetime. To polarise one area of sensibility against another may well be evidence of a repressive irrationality that is masked by reason, just as linear thought appears in the mystical literature under the mask of irrationality. Freud, in his ineptness in dealing with these issues from his bastion of Victorian biases, is perhaps the most obvious example of a long line of self-appointed inquisitors whose rigid notions of subjectivity reveal a hatred of sensibility as such. This has long ceased to be a light matter. If the Freuds of the late 19th century threatened to destroy our dreams, the Kahns, Tofflers and similar corporate rationalists threaten to destroy our futures. The most incisive critiques of reason, I think particularly of Horkheimer and Adorno's dialectic of enlightenment and Horkheimer's eclipse of reason, may well have founded on their failure to keep such distinctions in mind. Both thinkers clearly recognised a crucial ambiguity in reason, and they were unerring in their interpretation of the problems it raised. To speak of reason today 
is to address a process that has two entirely different orientations. One involves high ideals, binding values, and lofty goals for humanity as a whole that derive from supra-individual, almost transcendental canons of right and wrong, of virtue and evil. Reason, in this sense, is not a matter of personal opinion or taste. It seems to inhere in objective reality itself, in a sturdy belief in a rational and meaningful universe that is independent of our needs and proclivities as individuals. This mode of reason, which Horkheimer called objective reason, expresses the logos of the world and retains its integrity and validity apart from the interplay of human volition and interests. By contrast, what we commonly regard as reason, more properly as reasonable, is a strictly functional mentality guided by operational standards of logical consistency and pragmatic success. We formulate reasonable strategies for enhancing our well-being and chances of survival. Reason in this sense is merely a technique for advancing our personal opinions and interests. It is an instrument to efficiently achieve our individual ends, not to define them in the broader light of ethics and the social good. This instrumental reason, or to use Horkheimer's terms, subjective reason, in my view a very unhappy selection of words, is validated exclusively by its effectiveness in satisfying the ego's pursuits and responsibilities. It makes no appeal to values, ideals and goals that are larger than the requirements for effective adaptation to conditions as they exist. Carried beyond the individual to the social realm, instrumental reason, quote, serves any particular endeavour, good or bad, Horkheimer observes. Quote, it is the tool of all actions of society, but it must not try to set the patterns of social and individual life, end quote, which are really established or discarded by the mere preferences of society and the individual. In short, instrumental reason pays tribute not to the speculative mind, but merely to pragmatic technique. If reason is now faced with a crisis that challenges its credibility and validity, this challenge no longer stems from the traditional assaults of irrationality and mysticism, from which the Enlightenment tried to defend it. That battleground has been dissolved by history. Indeed, what today passes for irrationality and mysticism has become a fragile refuge from the assaults of instrumentalism and the crisis it has produced in reason. The contradictions besetting reason have their origins in the historic reduction of objective reason to instrumental reason. In the disquieting devolution of rationality as an inherent feature of reality to a reasonableness, so-called, that is merely an unthinking, efficient technique. If we mistrust reason today, it is because reason has enhanced our technical powers to alter the world drastically without providing us with the goals and values that give these powers direction and meaning. Like Captain Ahab in Melville's Moby Dick, 
we can cry out forlornly, All my means are sane, my motives and objects mad. To the most astute critics of instrumental reason, this devolution of objective reason into a logic of manipulation is viewed as a dialectic of rationality itself, an inversion of ends into means. According to these critics, the high ideals formulated by objective reason as were meant to sophisticate rationality as a technique have betrayed themselves to the very instrumentalism that was meant to be in their service. Thus, the ethical goals of the good, viewed existentially as social freedom and individual autonomy, are presumed to have presuppositions of their own. Freedom entails not only the social structure of freedom, we are told, but also a sufficiency in the means of life to practice freedom. Individual autonomy, in turn, entails not only the untrammeled opportunity for self-expression, but also the self-discipline to restrain the unruly commands of the ego. Freedom and individual autonomy, according to this critique, exact a historic toll. The historic deployment of instrumental reason to fulfil the goals reared by objective reason. Accordingly, to achieve these goals, humanity must attain sufficient control over nature, both external and internal nature, to transmute an ideal into a material and psychological reality. The precondition for freedom is domination, specifically the domination of the external, natural world by man. The precondition for personal autonomy is also domination, the domination of internal psychic nature by a rational apparatus of repression. This critique of instrumental reason and the crisis of reason thickens further when we are asked to bear in mind that freedom and individual autonomy presuppose not only the rational control of nature, but also the reduction of humanity to a well-regulated, efficient means of production. Class, society and the state have always been validated, even in certain radical theories, by the role they play in rationalising labour to a point where material production can ultimately be brought into the service of liberation. The toil of class society in extricating humanity from the domination of nature and myth is inextricably entangled with the toil of humanity in extricating itself from the domination of class society and instrumental reason. Indeed, the instrumentalization of nature as raw materials is thoroughly wedded to the instrumentalization of human beings as means of production. The devolution of reason from an inherent feature of reality into an efficient technique of control yields the dissolution of objective reason itself. The very source of objective reason, notably objective reality itself, is degraded into the mere materials upon which instrumental reason exercises its powers. Science, co-joined with technics, renders the entire cosmos into a devitalized arena for technical colonization and control. In objectifying humanity and nature alike, 
instrumental reason becomes the object of its own triumph over a reality that was once laden with meaning. Not only do means become ends, but the ends themselves are reduced to machines. Domination and freedom become interchangeable terms in a common project of subjugating nature and humanity, each of which is used as an excuse to validate the control of one by the other. The reasoning involved is strictly circular. The machine has not only run away without the driver, but the driver has become a mere part of the machine. The entire critique of reason, at least in the form I have elaborated so far, is itself actually laden with biases that it unknowingly transmutes into a dialectic of rationality. In fact, the dialectic of enlightenment is actually no dialectic at all, at least not in its attempt to explain the negation of reason through its own self-development. The entire work assumes that we hold a body of Victorian prejudices, many of them specifically Marxian and Freudian, that identify progress with increasing control of external and internal nature. Historical development is cast within an image of an increasingly disciplined humanity that is extricating itself from a brutish, unruly, mute natural history. The image of a humanity that has achieved the degree of productivity and administration that enables it to be free is modelled strictly on an industrial paradigm of mastery and discipline. But looking back from our own time, the critique dissolves into despair. Far from extricating itself from a seemingly brutish natural history, humanity has enmeshed itself in a ubiquitous system of domination that has no parallel in nature. Nowhere has history redeemed its promise of freedom and autonomy. To the contrary, it almost seems that history must begin anew, not as a split between humanity and its natural matrix, but rather as an elaboration of ecological ties by an instrumentalism that remains in the service of objective reason. Here is the nub of the problem. The Victorian veil, to which Marx and Freud gave a radical dimension, that obscures the function of ecology as a source of values and ideals. If objective reason has increasingly dissolved into instrumentalism, we must recover the rational dimension of reality that has always validated reason itself as an interpretation of the world. As long as the world is conceived scientistically, the preeminence of instrumentalism remains ideologically secure. As a value-free, presumably ethically neutral methodology, science not only fosters instrumentalism, but also makes of instrumental reason an ideology whose claims of comprehending reality are as universal as those of science itself. Here, social ecology opens a breach in these claims that, potentially, at least, may redeem the function of objective reason to once again define our goals and values. Neither Horkheimer nor Adorno were prepared to invoke 
the claims of nature against the failures of society. Like the Victorians of the century before, their attitude toward nature was ambiguous. The story of civilization, in their eyes, had never ceased to be a struggle by reason and freedom to transcend the trammels of unthinking myth and blind natural law. In the revolutionary world of the 1920s and 1930s, myth had atavistically raised its head in the fascist appeal to blood and soil, the so-called naturalism of the modern despotic state. Objective reason, so-called, rooted in a lawful natural world, had atavistically raised its head in the Stalinist appeal for a dialectics of nature. In both cases, nature had served as the ideological vehicle for regression. The one to place humanity under the tyranny of race and irrationality, the other to place the free play and spontaneity of an emancipated society under the tyranny of inexorable natural laws. Not that the latent anti-naturalism of Marxism had not cast a dark shadow over nature's role in humanity's project of emancipation, Homer's island of the lotus eaters is a denial of memory, history, culture and progress that forever haunts Europe's emphasis on human activity with the image of an atavistically immobilized and pacified dream world. But even as their Marxism subsided, Horkheimer and Adorno revealed an unforgiving hatred of the warped history that fascism and Stalinism had inflicted on the human enterprise. The current ecological crisis, however, reminds us that the preemptive claims of instrumental reason are failures on its own terms. Instrumentalism, particularly in its scientific form, has not only failed to live up to its historic claim of emancipating humanity, but it has even failed to approximate its more traditional claim of illuminating mind. Science, immersed in its impersonal gadgetry and its imperious quest for innovation, has lost all contact with the culture of its time. Worse yet, its quest for innovation threatens to tear down the planet itself. Far more than any moral or ideological verdict, these failures are tangible features of everyday life. They are verified by the foul air and water, the rising cancer rates, the automotive accidents, and the chemical wastelands that assault the entire world of a scientistic civilization, so-called. By reducing ethics to little more than matters of opinion and taste, instrumentalism has dissolved every moral and ethical constraint over the impending catastrophe that seems to await humanity. Judgments are no longer formed in terms of their intrinsic merits. They are merely matters of public consensus that fluctuate with changing particularistic interests and needs, having divested the world of its ethical objectivity and reduced reality to an inventory of industrial objects, instrumentalism threatens to keep us from formulating a critical stance toward its own role in the problems it has created. If Odin paid for wisdom with the loss of one eye, we have paid for our powers of control with the loss of both eyes.
but we can no more divest ourselves of instrumental reason than we can divest ourselves of techniques. Both are indispensable to expanded notions of freedom. Indeed, their emancipatory role long antedates the emergence of capitalism with its images of a stingy nature and unlimited needs. Humanity does not live by ethics alone. Herein lies one of freedom's most crucial ambiguities. In the face of an increasingly technocratic society and sensibility, on what grounds can we speak of an objective world that provides the needed constraints to instrumentalism? From what source can we derive the values and goals that will subserve instrumentalism to an objective ethics, to evoke nature as the source for an objectively grounded ethics, as I propose to do, requires a careful qualification. A nature conceived as the matrix of blood and soil, or as the domain of a blind dialectical lawfulness, that imbues tyranny with the superhuman qualities of inexorable destiny, would justly be regarded as atavistic. The racial ethos of fascism and the scientistic dialectics, so-called, of Stalinism, both based on very particularistic images of nature, have claimed a toll in life and suffering that beggars the most barbarous eras of human history. We no longer need a nature, that is, an authoritarian sociobiology that advances an ideological rationale for ethnic arrogance and concentration camps under the aegis of inevitability or blind law. But nature is not a homogeneous fabric that is woven from a single thread. The nature to which we can now address ourselves is neither bloody nor blind. It provides no ideological refuge for a mythos of irrationality, race, or, like Marxism, a contrived mechanism that passes itself off as a social science, concealed under the shroud of Hegel. The matrix from which objective reason may yet derive its ethics for a balanced and harmonized world is the nature conceived by a radical social ecology, a nature that is interpreted non-hierarchically in terms of unity in diversity and spontaneity. Here, nature is conceived not merely as a constellation of ecosystems, but also as a meaningful natural history, a developing, creative and fecund nature that yields an increasing complexity of forms and interrelationships. And what makes this complexity so significant is not just the stability it fosters, an obvious desideratum in its own right, needed for both the biotic and social worlds. Nature's evolution toward ever more complex forms is uniquely important in that it enters into the history of subjectivity itself. From the transition of the inorganic to the organic, and through the various phases of evolution that crystallized into human forms of rationality, we witness an increasingly expansive history of molecular interactivity, not only of neurological responses, but of an ineffable sensibilité that is a function of increasingly complex patterns of integration. Subjectivity expresses itself in various gradations, not only 
as the mentalism of reason, but also as the interactivity, reactivity, and the growing purposive activity of forms. Hence, subjectivity emphatically does not exclude reason. In part, it is the history of reason, or more precisely, of a slowly forming mentality that exists on the wider terrain of reality than human cerebral activity. The term subjectivity expresses the fact that substance, at each level of its organization and in all its concrete forms, actively functions to maintain its identity, equilibrium, fecundity, and place in a given constellation of phenomena. Normally, we think of substance in its various forms as passive objects, as yielding phenomena that are moulded or selected by their environments. External forces seem to determine the traits that enable material forms, particularly life forms, to retain their integrity and survive. Science's passion for reducing all changes within these forms to mere products of accident, the capacity of these forms to mutate by mere chance, fatally denies the high degree of nisus, or self-organization and self-creation, inherent in non-human phenomena. Science comes perilously close to the very metaphysics and mysticism it has opposed so militantly since the Enlightenment, when it ignores the extent to which phenomena play an active role in their own evolutionary processes. The traditional image of biological evolution as a series of random point mutations that are selected in the interests of survival essentially lies in debris. It would be difficult to explain the elegant organization of living beings, indeed of organs like the eye or ear, without viewing their developmental traits as imminently and creatively constituted, as organized ensembles that emerge together in the organism's interaction with the world around it. The jigsaw puzzles fit, so to speak, involves the parts as well as the whole, not just the player who is the mechanical deus ex machina that seems to be the exclusive intelligible factor in the entire puzzle. It is arguable whether the preference of carbon atoms to be linked with four other atoms is related by a long evolution of subjectivity to a chimpanzee's use of sticks to probe ant hills. But the very strong possibility of such a continuum, gradually mediated by increasingly complex forms of material organization, can no longer be dismissed as mystical. Almost every contemporary vision of nature, apart from the most entrenched bunkers of Victorian science, has increasingly assigned to substance itself more a creative role in the evolution of subjectivity than at any time since the demise of classical philosophy. Accordingly, whether or not we decide to select reason as the most complex expression of subjectivity, the graded emergence of mind in the natural history of life is part of the larger landscape of subjectivity itself. From the biochemical responses of a plant to its environment, to the most willful actions of a scientist in the laboratory, a common bond of primal subjectivity inheres 
in the very organization of matter itself. In this sense, the human mind has never been alone, even in the most inorganic of surroundings. Art has expressed this message more poignantly than science, particularly in those abstract paintings evacuated of virtually all sensory experience beyond colour and form. For here we recognise the primal affinity of mind with form itself. Even those pirates of space travel, the astronauts, are awed by the activity of astral masses, of the cosmic dust and objects swirling around them in a world that seems devoid of matter. In a space that generations of scientists once regarded as a virtual vacuum, mind reaches beyond our cerebral mentalism to a concept of subjectivity in these very broad terms and ceases to be trapped exclusively within the human brain. Instead, it seems to inhere in the human body as a whole and the natural history it embodies. Which specific ethical imperatives we draw from an ecological interpretation of nature as distinguished from the abstract, meaningless, desubjectivized nature that chilled the Victorian mind by its stinginess and brutality? depend, ultimately, on our exploration of a future ecological society. Here is a problematic whose answers can be supplied only by a society capable of rendering them into a living praxis. An ecological nature and the objective ethics following from it can spring to life, as it were, only in a society whose sensibilities and interrelationships have become ecological to their very core. The nature we normally create today is highly conditioned by the social imperatives of our time. This nature may be science's highly quantified nature. The Marxian abstract matter that is formed by abstract labour, the mystic's cosmos dissolved into an unrelieved universal oneness, sociobiology's hierarchical nature organised around primal instincts and drives, the Hobbesian Freudian nature impudently unruly and invasive, or the vulgarised Darwinian nature governed by fang and claw. I have not even alluded to the animistic, Hellenic, Judeo-Christian, medieval and Renaissance images of nature that still ideologically marble those which I have cited above. None of the modern images of nature offers a compelling vision of a wholeness that is permeated. As a result of its wholeness, by a larger sense of subjectivity, which we normally identify with human rationality. Each illustrates not so much the need to resurrect nature as the need to resurrect human subjectivity itself. The flaw in Horkheimer and Adorno's works on reason stems from their failure to integrate rationality with subjectivity in order to bring nature within the compass of sensibilité. To do so, they would have had to understand the message of social ecology, a realm that was completely outside their intellectual tradition. Here, their subdued adherence to Marxism became a major obstacle to what otherwise could have been a superbly comprehensive critique of instrumental reason. They were too afraid to cement their view of nature to subjectivity. <laughs>
a commitment they identified with mythic and classical archaisms. Hence, they never provided a meaningful objective matrix for reason. The wish to make this commitment haunts their entire work on reason and enlightenment, but it is a wish they were too prudent to satisfy. But how can we, who are more familiar with the possibilities of ecology, avoid the invasion of instrumentalism into an ecological approach to ethics? How can we prevent it from turning nature into a mere object for manipulation in the very name of respecting its subjectivity? None of these questions can be answered satisfactorily without recreating our existing sensibilities, techniques and communities along ecological lines. Once this occurred, then an ecological community might well recover its sense of place in its specific ecosystem by allaying itself with its natural environment in a creatively reproductive form, a form that spawns a human symbiotic sensibility, a human techniques that enriches nature's complexity, and a human rationality that enlarges nature's subjectivity. Here, humanity would neither give nor take. It would actually participate with nature in creating the new levels of diversity and form as a part of a more heightened sense of humaneness and naturalness. Our ethical claim to rationality would derive from the participation of human mind in the larger subjectivity of nature, a subjectivity that is a function of form, integration and complexity. The use of nature as natural resources, a usage that seems unavoidable to the purposive rational mind, to use Jürgen Habermas's jargon, would be diminished, indeed eliminated by an ecological techniques that would neither enrich the flow between nature and humanity, but also sensitize humanity to the creativity of nature. Lest these good intentions seem like just another case of the simplistic sentimentality, so characteristic of nature philosophies as a whole, let me emphasize that an ecological ethics is not patterned on a naive vision of the natural world. Either as it exists today, or as it might exist in a pacified social future. A wolf has no business lying down with a lamb. The imagery is trite and in its own way repellent. The pacification of nature does not consist in its domestication. Very much is lost when wildness, a stupid word if there ever was one, is removed so completely from nature that it ceases to be a token of scarcity, suffering and want, to use Herbert Marcuse's absurd notion of a nature that has been recreated by the power of reason. Marcuse's language here is anthropomorphic in its myopia, Marxist in its intent, and preposterous in its claim that, quote, pacification presupposes the mastery of nature, which is and remains the object opposed to the developing subject, end quote. If there are, quote, two kinds of mastery, a repressive and a liberatory one, one might also claim with equal absurdity that there are two kinds of nature, an evil one and a virtuous one. Leaving this muddled logic aside, there is no cruelty in nature, only the predation and mutualism around which natural history has evolved its structures for sustaining life 
and ecological balance. There is no suffering in nature, only the unavoidable physical pain that comes with injury. There is no scarcity and want in nature, only needs that must be satisfied if life itself is to be maintained. Indeed, the material fecundity of nature, prior to history's negation of nature, to use Marcuse's language again, might have completely stunned its earliest hominid offspring, had they even been mindful of scarcity as a social category. I cannot emphasize too strongly that nature itself is not an ethics. It is the matrix for an ethics, the source of ethical meaning that can be rooted in objective reality. Hence, nature, even as the matrix and source of ethical meaning, does not have to assume such delightfully human attributes as kindness, virtue, goodness and gentleness. Nature need merely be fecund and creative, a source rather than a paradigm. The function of an ethical philosophy does not entail a mimetic reduction of ethics to its source. Rather, it requires a ground from which to creatively develop ethical ideals. The child is not the parent, but both are united by the objective continuity of genetic ancestry, gestation, birth and socialization. The two never completely separate, they coexist, and their lives overlap under normal conditions until the child grows to adulthood and becomes a parent. In either case, we are obliged to understand why one course of development unfolded, not merely how it occurred, and to give it meaning, coherence and ethical interpretation. In any case, the development is real, and we cannot suppress our responsibility to interpret it in ethical terms by claiming that it is merely a series of random events. To transmute pacification into domestication is to deal with nature as a model of ethical behaviour rather than to accept it for what it really is, a source of ethical meaning that re-establishes our sense of ecological wholeness, the underlying dialectic of unity in diversity. It is this lack of wholeness in our relationship with nature that really explains the unfinished social cosmos in which we live, the sense of incompleteness that exists around us. Not only does a truly pacified and domesticated natural world arrogantly model nature on society, rational or not, but it also fails to recognise that human rationality is a phase or aspect of natural subjectivity. It is no accident that Marcuse's pacified nature is in fact a rational nature. Paul Shepard, in a superb refutation of the self-styled peacemakers of nature, observes that Quote, each gene in an individual organism acts in the context of many other genes. Hence, the genetic changes resulting from domestication may affect the whole creature, its appearance, behavior, and physiology. The temperament and personality of domestic animals are not only more placid than their wild counterparts, but also more flaccid. That is, there is somehow less definition. Of course, there is nothing placid about an angry bull or a mean watchdog, but their mothers were tractable, and once 
an organism has been stripped of its wildness. It can be freaked in any direction the breeder wishes. It may be made fierce without being truly wild. The latter implies an ecological niche from which the domesticated animal has been removed. Niches are hard taskmasters. Escape from them is not freedom but loss of direction. Man substitutes controlled breeding for natural selection. Animals are selected for special traits like milk production or passivity at the expense of overall fitness and nature-wide relationships. End quote. There is an important moral to be drawn from these remarks that applies not just to animals but human beings as well. The freedom of all organisms is a function of direction, of meaningful niches in nature and meaningful communities in society. To be sure, the two are not completely congruent, but there is every reason to regard them as derivative. Community from niche, human being from wild animal. In its own way, our loss of community has been a form of domestication, a condition that lacks meaning and direction, as surely as the wild animal's loss of its niche. Like our cattle, poultry, pets and even crops, we too have lost our wildness in a pacified world that is overly administered and highly rationalised. The private world we created in our pre-political communities, the niches we occupied in the hidden spaces of social life, are quickly disappearing. Like the genetic structures of domestic animals, the psychic structures of domesticated humans are undergoing perilous degradation. More than ever, we must recover the continuum between our first nature and our second nature, our natural world and our social world, our biological being and our rationality. Latent within us are ancestral memories that only an ecological society and sensibility can resurrect. The history of human reason has not yet reached its culmination, much less its end. Once we can resurrect our subjectivity and restore it to its heights of sensibility, then in all likelihood that history will have just begun. In summary, human rationality must be seen as a form and a derivative of a broader mentality or subjectivity that inheres in nature as a whole, specifically in the long development of increasingly complex forms of substance over the course of natural history. We must be very clear about what this means. Natural history includes a history of mind, as well as of physical structures. A history of mind that develops from the seemingly passive interactivity of the inorganic to the highly active cerebral processes of human intellect and volition. This history of what we call mind is cumulatively present not only in the human mind, but also in our bodies as a whole, which largely recapitulates the expansive development of life forms at various neurophysical levels of evolution. What we tragically lack today, primarily because instrumentalism tyrannizes our bodily apparatus, is the ability to sense the wealth of subjectivity inherent in ourselves and in the non-human world around us. To some extent, this wealth reaches us through art, fantasy, play, intuition, creativity, sexuality, and early in our lives in those sensibilities of childhood and youth from which adulthood and the norms of maturity 
wean us in the years that follow. The landscape of nature, its formal organization, from the astral level of our universe to the least noticeable ecosystems around us, has messages of its own to impart. It, too, has a voice to which Bruno and Kepler in the Renaissance and the growing number of life scientists today have tried to respond. Indeed, from the time of Pythagoras onward, the classical tradition in philosophy found subjectivity in the evolution of forms as such, not only in the morphology of individual beings, conceived as an active process of ever-growing interrelated complexity, the balance of nature can be viewed as more than a formal ensemble that life presupposes for its own stability and survival, and can also be viewed as a formal ensemble whose very organization into integrated wholes exhibits varying levels of mentalism, a subjectivity to which we will respond only if we free our sensorium from its instrumentalist inhibitions and conventions. Our interpretation of science is not far removed from our interpretation of reason, viewed as the methodical application of reason to the concrete world. Science has acquired the bad name that instrumentalism and techniques have earned over the past few decades. Its overstated claims as a strategy for observation, experimentation, and the generalization of data into inexorable natural laws, and its highly vaunted assertions of objectivity and intellectual universality, have exposed it to charges of an unfeeling arrogance toward sentiment, ethics, and a growing crisis in the human condition. Once regarded as the herald of enlightenment in all spheres of knowledge, science is now increasingly seen as a strictly instrumental system of control. Its use as a means of social manipulation and its role in restricting human freedom now parallel in every detail its use as a means of natural manipulation. Most of its discoveries in physics, chemistry and biology are justly viewed with suspicion by its once most fervent adepts. As the controversies over nuclear power and recombinant DNA so vividly reveal. Accordingly, science no longer enjoys a reputation as a means of knowing, of Wissenschaft, to use the language of the German Enlightenment, but as a means of domination, or what Max Scheler in a later, more disenchanted time called Herrschaft Wissen. It has become, in effect, a cold, unfeeling, metaphysically grounded techniques that has imperialistically expanded beyond its limited realm as a form of knowing to claim the entire realm of knowledge as such. We are thus confronted with the paradox that science, as indispensable tool for human well-being, is now a means for subverting its traditional humanistic function. The ethical neutrality of the nuclear physicist, the food chemist and the bacteriologist involved in developing lethal pathogens for military purposes is a numbing symbol of a science run wild that compares in even more frightening detail to the image of a technics run wild. The heated controversies over the hazards of nuclear power and recombinant DNA are evidence that science is thoroughly entangled in debates that deal with its claims 
not just to technical competence, but to moral maturity as well. Like reason and techniques, science too has a history and, broadly conceived beyond its instrumentalist definition, it can be regarded as that history. What we so glibly call Greek science was largely a nature philosophy that imparted to speculative reason the capacity to comprehend the natural world, to understand and impart coherence to nature, was an activity of the contemplative mind, not merely of experimental technique. Viewed from the standpoint of this rational framework, Plato and Aristotle's considerable corpus of writings on nature were not wrong in their accounts of the natural world. Within this large body of nature philosophy, we find insights and a breadth of grasp and scope that the physical and life sciences are now trying to recover. Their varying emphases on substance, form and development, what normally are depicted as a qualitative orientation as distinguished from modern science's quantitative orientation, exhibit a range of thought that may well be regarded as broader, or at least more organic, than science's traditional emphases on matter and motion. The classical tradition stressed activity, organisation and process. The Enlightenment tradition stressed matter's passivity, random features and mechanical movement. That the Enlightenment tradition has yielded slowly to the classical, a development forced upon it by a growing sense of nature's historicity, contextual qualities and the importance of form, has not led to a clear understanding of the differences separating them and the way in which they share a historical continuity that could yield their integration without any loss of their specific identities. To call classical mechanistic, evolutionary and relativistic forms of science complementary may very well miss a crucial point. They do not simply supplement one another, nor are they stages in humanity's increasing knowledge of nature, a knowledge that presumably culminates in modern science. This kind of thinking about the history of science is still very popular and often highly presumptuous in its elevation of all things modern and presumably free of speculation and theology. Actually, these different forms of science encompass different levels of natural development and differ in their avowed scope. They are not simply different paradigms, as Thomas Kuhn has argued, that radically replace one another. To assume that there is a science as such, in which the classical tradition is largely erroneous, in which the Renaissance tradition is partly correct, and in which the modern tradition is more true in its understanding of nature than any of its predecessors, is to assume that nature is cut from a single cloth and differs only in its form of tailoring. Ironically, Kuhn's views have been attacked most harshly, not so much by critics who reject the history of science as a displacement of one prevailing scientific paradigm by a different one. Rather, he has been most sharply criticised for his tendency to view the logic of scientific revolutions as being guided by techniques of persuasion rather than by proof, by psychological and social factors rather than by the test of objective studies of reality. 
ignoring Kuhn's later attempt to backtrack upon his more challenging conclusions about the structure of the scientific community itself. What is most striking about his views of the paradigmatic revolutions in science is the way in which they have been contrasted with one another. I speak less of Kuhn here than of the conventional wisdom of scientism which tends to focus on the methodological differences between classical nature philosophy and modern science. The common notion that modern science really embarked upon its unique voyage when it consciously adopted Francis Bacon's program of controlled empirical observation and experimental verification is a trite myth that more accurately reflects the intellectual conflicts in Bacon's time than it does the authentic differences between classical and Renaissance notions of nature. Without necessarily articulating it, classical nature philosophers had been working with Bacon's program of observation and experimentation for centuries. Perhaps more appropriately, Bacon, with his great instauration, gave science a function that classical theory had never fully accepted. Man's recovery of his mastery over the natural world. A view that was pitted against the medieval schoolman's, actually Christianity's, contemplative orientation over nature. Yet, even here, it is still misleading to assume that the classical tradition, like the medieval, was strictly contemplative and that the modern was overwhelmingly pragmatic. The idea of domination had been an ongoing practice in the form of human domination, of a humanity conceived by its rulers as natural resources, so-called or means of production, so-called, from the inception of civilization itself. Bacon's great instauration had been a functioning reality for thousands of years, not merely in class societies, attempts to subjugate nature for the purposes of control, but to subjugate humanity itself, its temple was not Bacon's utopian laboratory, the House of Salomon, but the state, with its bureaucracies, armies, and the knouts of its foremen. We do a grave injustice to the authentic history of scientific method, when we forget that before science established its laboratory to control nature, the state had established its palaces and barracks to control humanity. The great instauration drew its inspiration from the domination of human by human before it made the domination of nature central to its ideals and functions. The most fundamental difference between classical nature philosophy and modern science lies in their radically different concepts of causality. Here, is a real ontological issue, not the turgid chatter about methodology that separates knowledge itself from mere matters of technique that clarifies the all-important problem of the relationship of means to ends, which is so vital to any critique of instrumental reason and an authoritarian techniques. To Aristotle, who never ceased to be a keen observer, a sophisticated generalizer, and committed experimenter like Archimedes after him, natural causality was not exhausted by mechanical motion. Causation involved the very material to potentiality for form, the formative agent and the most advanced form toward which a phenomenon could develop. His concept of causality in effect, was entelechial. It assumed that a phenomenon was drawn 
to actualize its full potentiality for achieving the highest form specific to it, to develop intrinsically and extrinsically toward the formal self-realization of its potentialities. Hence, causation to Aristotle is not merely motion that involves change of place, like the change of place produced by one billiard ball striking another. While it may certainly be mechanical, causation is more meaningfully and significantly developmental. It should be seen more as a graded process, as an emerging process of self-realization, than as a series of physical displacements. Accordingly, matter, which always has varying degrees of form, is latent with potentiality. Indeed, it is imbued by a nisus to elaborate its potentiality for greater form. Hence, it enters into Aristotle's notion of causation as a material cause. The form that is latent in matter and strives toward its full actualization is a formal cause. The intrinsic and the extrinsic forces that sculpt the development, here in the latter case, Aristotle refers to external agents, like the sculptor who fashions a bronze horse, are the efficient cause. And lastly, the form that all these aspects of causality are meant to actualize represents the final cause. Aristotelian causality, in effect, is not only developmental, but also directive and purposive. It has also been called teleological, because the final form toward which substance strives is latent in the beginning of the development. The term, however, is redolent with notions of a predetermined, inexorable end, a notion that Aristotle takes great pains to eschew. In On Interpretation, he is careful to point out that, quote, It cannot be said without qualification that all existence and non-existence is the outcome of necessity. For there is a difference between saying that which is, when it is, must needs be, and simply saying that all that is must needs be. And similarly, in the case of that which is not. In the case also of two contradictory propositions, this holds good. Everything must either be or not be, whether in the present or in the future. But it is not always possible to distinguish and state determinately which of these alternatives must necessarily come about. End quote. What characterizes the teleological dimension of Aristotelian causality is that it has meaning, not predetermination. Causality is oriented toward achieving wholeness, the fulfillment and completeness of all the potentialities for form latent in substance at different levels of its development. This sense of meaning is permeated by ethics. Quote, For in all things as we affirm, nature always strives after the better. End quote. Here the word strive requires emphasis, for Aristotle rarely imputes thought in our cerebral meaning of the term, to nature. Rather, nature is an organized oikos, a good household, and, quote, like every good householder, is not in the habit of throwing away anything from which it is possible to make anything useful, end quote. To the extent to which this brilliant insight, so integral to Aristotle's overall philosophy, 
has been confirmed by ecology and paleoontology can hardly be emphasized too much. Within the framework of Aristotelian causality, Hegel's concept of dialectic, a grossly abused term these days, is virtually congruent with Aristotle's causal orientation. Like Aristotle, Hegel's entire goal is to comprehend the notion of wholeness, not a specious synthesis that is formed from the transformation of a thesis into its antithesis. Such a methodological formula for dialectic not only divests it of all organic content, but reduces dialectic to a method, an instrumental technique in the high tradition of Marxian orthodoxy, rather than an ontological causality. As Hegel observes in one of his most trenchant accounts of the dialectic, quote, but that which is implicit comes into existence. It certainly passes into change, yet it remains one and the same, for the whole process is dominated by it. The plant, for example, does not lose itself in mere indefinite change. From the germ, much is produced when at first nothing was to be seen. But the whole of what is brought forth, if not developed, is yet hidden and ideally contained within itself. The principle of this projection into existence is that the germ cannot remain merely implicit, but it is impelled toward development, since it presents the contradiction of being only implicit and yet not desiring so to be. But this coming without itself has an end in view. Its completion is fully reached, and its previously determined end is the fruit or produce of the germ, which causes a return to the first condition. End quote. Mind carries this movement further for Hegel, and rather than doubling back to its germinal form, goes forth to the full realization of coming to itself. What is crucial for both Hegel and Aristotle is their common notion of final cause, their commitment to wholeness and meaning in phenomena. More than any aspect of Aristotle's ideas, this one was to become a veritable battleground between science and schoolman theology. Indeed, to the extent that mechanism became the prevalent paradigm of Renaissance and Enlightenment science, the notion of final cause became the grist mill on which science sharpened its scalpel of objectivity, scientific disinterestedness, and the total rejection of values in the scientific organon to imply a sense of direction in causality, a why rather than merely a how in nature, was redolent of theology. Medieval scholasticism had so thoroughly Christianized Aristotelian nature philosophy and causality that the Renaissance mechanicians viewed them as little more than a system of Catholic apologetics. Even Hobbes's vision of a social mechanics veered sharply into a critique of Aristotle's final cause. To be sure, this conflict was unavoidable and even freed Aristotle's own thought from the inquisitorial grip of the church. But opposition and persecution, Bruno and Servetus were to go to the stake and Galileo to confinement as science's principal martyrs in this conflict, led to an exaggerated rejection 
of all organicism. Indeed, to an astringent Cartesian dualism between a soulful subjectivity exclusively confined to man and a strictly mechanical quantitative view of physical nature. But this battle was not won without a severe penalty. To free the human mind from the trammels of religion, humanity itself was enslaved to the powers of science. A new organon replaced the old. Bacon's ideal of humanity's recovery, of its mastery over nature, did not cleanse it of the taint of original sin and restore it to the plenitude of the Garden of Eden. Science joined hands with techniques to reinforce the mastery of human over human by enslaving humanity to the same dark, mythic world of domination that it once had ideologically opposed. Science itself had now become a theology. Beginning with the 19th century, humanity has become increasingly instrumentalized, objectivized, and economized. Even more than the very controlled nature that Bacon's great instauration had intended to create. Rationalization has combined with science to produce a technocracy that now threatens to divest humanity itself and its natural environment of the subjectivity by which the Enlightenment had intended to illuminate the world. Philosophical orientations that replace one paradigm by another in the course of intellectual revolutions produce a serious breakdown of continuity, integration and wholeness in the realm of knowledge. They disrupt the ecology and history of knowledge itself, in social theory as much as in scientific theory. We have lost a tremendous wealth of exciting traditions by substituting a Hobbesian project of social science for an Aristotelian project of social ethics. Not that the Aristotelian provides the highest point we could hope to attain in social theory. The all-pervasive sweep of Christianity over the European world, followed more recently by Marxism, has interred an invaluable body of social ideals and insights. In our own time, one is reminded of the loss of the intensely libertarian hopes fostered by radical groups in the English, American and French revolutions, all of which have been blanketed by the Leninist revolutions of the present century, or consigned, to use Trotsky's noxious phrase, to the dustbin of history. One is also reminded of the wealth of utopian ideas from which Marx pilfered before replacing them with the myth of a scientific socialism. Like Christianity before it, socialism has fostered a dogmatic fanaticism that closed off countless new possibilities, not only to human action, but also to human thought and imagination. Science, while less demanding in its attacks upon its own heretics, exhibits an equal degree of fanaticism in its intellectual claims. To defy science's metaphysical, often mystical, presuppositions that are rooted in an eerily passive matter and a physical concept of motion is to expose oneself to accusations of metaphysics and mysticism, and to an intellectual persecution that science itself once suffered at the hands of its theological inquisitors. There is a strong tendency within new scientific paradigms to view various forms of different natures, inorganic and organic, kinetic and developmental, random and meaningful, as inherently antagonistic to one another, rather than as different in scope, as levels of development and as components of a larger whole. Only recently have we begun to escape from a mechanistic reductionism of all natural phenomena to a paradigm based 
on mathematical physics. The widely touted unity of science, which theorists of the last century advanced during the triumphant heights of the Newtonian cosmic image, was often little more than an intellectual nightmare, a oneness rather than a unity of science, which theorists of the last century advanced during the most unreconstructed mysticism that Western thought had ever achieved. Nothing could be more riddled by metaphysical and mystical notions than a causality reduced almost entirely to a universe based on a kinetics of interacting forces at a distance and of motion that, to explain chemical bonding, yielded more interlocking arrangements between atoms. By Laplace's time, nature was seen as a kinetic agglomeration of irreducible atoms from which the cosmos was constructed like a solid Victorian bank. The conception of atoms as the building blocks of the universe was taken literally, and even the deity was seen less as a creator or parent of the world than as an architect. This image designated a passive nature sculpted by intrinsic, often random, forces, which qualified ruling elites could manipulate according to their interests, once science had unlocked the secrets of an enchanted and cryptic nature. Efficient cause removed from the larger ethical matrix of Aristotelian causality was now conceived as the sole description for natural phenomena in kinetic interaction. The image of nature as a construction site, which even Bloch borrowed, produced its own technological cant. Terms like building blocks, mortar and cement that are still commonplace in works on physics replaced classical philosophy's images of love and hate, justice and injustice, entelechy and kinesis that, for all their anthropomorphic qualities, implied not only an enchanted nature or even an ethical nature, but a passionate nature. What remained from the past to explain the ultimate Newtonian mystery of action at a distance, and the troubling facts of gravitation were the terms attraction and repulsion, terms that still survive in electromagnetism. It is difficult to explain how much this technological cant and the imagery it reflected served the interests of domination in an industrial market society. For this cant was not merely philosophical, but eminently social in its character, just as the language of present-day systems theory. With its extensions of terms like input, output and feedback into everyday discourse reflects the corporatization of daily life, its reduction to a flow diagram, to conceive of all phenomena as constructed from a homogeneous, lifeless, passive and malleable matter was to place humanity itself within the orbit of all these attributes. Flesh, no less than stone and steel, was merely matter that had been accidentally structured into a more elaborate agglomeration of the same irreducible material. Even thought had lost its higher state and was instead conceived as a fluid that formed an exudate of the brain and the nervous system. Labour, as mere energy, was considered to be rooted not merely in political economy, but also in the economy of nature. This opened a direct tie between the radical critique developed by Marx and accommodative strategies formulated in a later period by social Darwinism. The Enlightenment ideal of human re-education according to the canons of reason, was interpreted to mean training according to canons of efficient performance. Science, seen in terms of a history that wantonly discarded its past by a radical succession of paradigms, 
stands alone in the world because it has marched through this succession apart from nature, having divested itself of antecedents that once addressed themselves to the different emerging levels of natural history. Science now lacks the continuity that relates these levels intelligibly. It lacks a sense of limit that confirms what is or is not valid in various ways of knowing reality. It lacks an awareness of new forms of reality that linger on the boundaries of established data. In short, modern science has not developed in relation to nature. But in relation to its own paradigms, the pursuit of the unity of science should, in no sense, be understood as a pursuit of the unity of nature. The former is an intellectual enterprise between scientific contestants and collaborators, not an enterprise that authentically involves the natural world. The rediscovery of nature is more important at this point in the development of human knowledge. Than are such trite enterprises as the reenchantment of the world, a phrase that tends to dissolve into mere metaphor when it lacks the flesh of social insight and a naturalistic elaboration. If science is to resolve the dilemma of its rationalization in the social world, it must learn to balance the need for self-interpretation with the insights furnished by different levels of natural development. Science. Must turn to nature itself for nutriment. It must be thoroughly mindful of the presuppositions, the biases that continually enter into its epistemological structures. The debates between supporters of one paradigm and another must be infused with a sense of history, both natural and intellectual, rather than to rest on dynastic ideological successions and exclusions. Science. Must candidly ask itself questions shaped by natural reality, not only by self-enclosed intellectualism that separates its ideological history from the history of the natural world. Hence, science must overcome its ambiguities by recognizing that it is both its own history as a whole, not one or another phase of that history, and natural history as well. In this sense, neither Aristotle nor Galileo were wrong per se. However much the latter detested the former, they observed different aspects of realities imparted to them by nature and by different levels of natural development. Underlying any project for rediscovering nature is a body of key questions. If There is any unity of nature to be discovered. What message does it have to offer? What is its essential meaning? And if we are to talk of meaning in nature, of the why as well as the how of natural phenomena, how are we to develop graded forms of causality, whether they are Hellenic or modern, for example, or the phasing of one into the other, so that we do not completely exclude one? Or the other, and if we grant that meaning does exist, how are we to interpret its direction, its teleology? Must we foreclose the possibility that ends may be latent in beginnings by speaking of teleology as if the end must necessarily flow from its beginning as a totally preordained final cause? Can we loosen up our current narrow? Ironclad notions of teleology to see it more as a graded, emergent, and creative development, rather than an overly deterministic form of causality. These questions, so crucial for developing an ecological ethics and an ecologically oriented science, cannot stay frozen in the forms used by crude scientific ideologues for centuries. If Nothing else. We must reclaim the right to think freely about ideas and reality, without having restrictions imposed upon us by ideologues who merely answer each other's errors with errors of their own. Science, in effect, 
must cease to be a church. It must tear down the ecclesiastical barriers that separate it from the free air of nature and from the garden which nourished its intellectual development. Techniques The skills and the instruments for humanity's metabolism with nature formed the crucible in which the modern concepts of reason and science were actually forged. In the sphere of production, in Marx's realm of necessity, the ambiguities of freedom emerged with unadorned clarity. During the modern industrial era, and even earlier, during certain pre-industrial periods, reason finally became mere rationalization and science was visibly transmuted from a pursuit of knowledge into mere technique and instrumentalism. Hence, it should not seem surprising that techniques exhibits the ambiguities of freedom in their most striking form. The notion that technology is intrinsically morally neutral, that the proverbial knife cuts either away as weapon to kill or as tool to cut, depending upon the user or the society in which it is used, was not a widely accepted viewpoint until the rise of industrialism. To be sure, knives, like other hand tools, can be viewed in such ethically neutral terms. But in the larger context of techniques, notably tools, machines, skills, forms of labour and natural resources, the means of production rarely are regarded as value-free, nor was their impact contingent merely on individual or social intentions. Although pre-industrial societies may not have explicitly distinguished between libertarian and authoritarian techniques, a distinction that probably forced itself upon the modern mind with the massive supremacy of highly centralised industrial technologies over traditional crafts, they apparently were more aware than we of the ecological implications of technique. If Stefan Tolmin and June Goodfield are correct in their appraisal, pre-industrial communities distinguished very early in history between natural arts and artificial crafts, a distinction that expressed ethical outlooks basically different from our own toward technological development. The natural arts, such as farming, husbandry and medicine, were patently necessary for human survival, and their place in the preservation of the individual and the community was of central importance. But they were natural, not just for pragmatic reasons. Their very success in satisfying basic human needs required that they be subtly in rhythm with a natural change. The artisan's insight melded human craft and nature together into not only the natural materials required by the anvilic Eskimos for their soapstone artistry, but also the larger natural processes that determined the success of an enterprise. Tolmin and a Goodfield, in effect, refer to a cosmic tableau in which the natural person engaged in a natural art was situated in order to steer these natural processes in a favourable direction and to utilise certain natural powers stronger than those possessed by the individual to remedy the disasters that afflicted agriculture or health. Accordingly, all efforts were valueless if one failed to act at the correct time in synchrony with natural cycles. Ritual became as much a part of production as seasonal changes, climatic variations, drought and predation. Or, in the case of medicine, the periodic onset of certain illnesses. It is fair to say that we are reclaiming these remote, apparently lost sensibilities today 
with our growing awareness that sound food cultivation and good health presuppose the attunement of life and crafts with biological cycles that foster soil fertility and physical well-being. Both the organic farmer and a serious practitioner of holistic health, for example, have been obliged to cultivate insights that extend far beyond the conventional wisdom of the agronomist and the physician. Certain all-important notions that nutriment and health are not merely industrial products, artifacts, magic bullets, that can be engineered into existence that our modern pharmacopias for agriculture and physical well-being cannot function as substitutes for a wisely crafted way of life, that life itself is a calling which rests on that rare combination of craft and nature we designate as art, have their roots in ancient notions of a sense of craft that is in step with the ruling cycles of natural change. By contrast, the artificial crafts played a much smaller part in men's lives than the natural arts, Tolmin and Goodfield observe. Quote, Given flint tools and weapons and some pottery, life was supportable as a primitive level without metal, glass or perfume, even in an English winter. Unquote. These remarks belabor the obvious and render the distinction between natural arts and artificial crafts merely pragmatic. We must not ignore the essentially metaphysical aspects that distinguish them. Artificial or not, early crafts such as metalworking, glassmaking, and dyeing, quote, alike had the task of imitating nature and of creating products which were indistinguishable from the best natural materials. The earliest glass objects known are certain Egyptian beads, which were used as personal ornaments in place of precious stones. Even then, they were known as sparklers. Glassmaking thus began as the production of artificial jewels, and since gold and jewels were always in short supply, men continued to think of the crafts in this light as late as classical times. The metal workers of Alexandria, for instance, produced silver and copper alloys having the appearance and properties of gold, and they developed, for this purpose, a whole range of techniques for depositing a durable golden colour on a relatively cheap alloy. There was nothing necessarily fraudulent about these techniques. Men were paying for the appearance, not the atomic weights. So the craftsmen and customers alike were entitled to be satisfied with the results. End quote. Hence the natural rather than the valuable, the useful and beautiful rather than the costly and the rare still retained their primordial hold even on artificially crafted products. Use value, as it were, held its predominant position over exchange value, and the glitter of the utopian held sway over the dross of self-interest, to the degree that the craftsperson imitated nature. He or she had entered into a quasi-mystical communion that authenticated the natural qualities of human-made products. Skill was permeated by the imagery of a natural endowment, of gifts bestowed upon the craftsperson by natural forces, gifts that in some sense had to be reciprocated. The naturalistic law of return reflects a distinctly ecological sensibility, indeed a sense of responsibility that involves compensation for what is withdrawn or even simulated in the natural world. Hence, as Tulmin and Goodfield tell us, quote, a ritual element 
can be found also in the artificial crafts of the ancient world, where at first sight the recipes for producing the product looked so much more direct. For example, in the Mesopotamian recipes for glass and glazes, instructions for the necessary technical procedures are accompanied by other injunctions of a ritual kind. The recipes from the library of Assurbanipal, 7th century BC, begin by explaining that the glass furnace must be built at the auspicious time. A shrine to the appropriate gods must be installed, and care must be taken to keep the goodwill of the deities in the daily operations of the workshop. End quote. In laying the plans for the glass furnace, the builder was warned to set a censer of pine incense as an offer to the embryo gods, a reference that, as Tulmin and Goodfield observe, quote, has a history in the earlier set of recipes dating from 1600 BC. There is a very obscure passage in which some scholars have seen evidence that actual human embryos, possibly stillborn infants, were buried in the furnace. What could have been the point of this? There is still little contemporary evidence, but perhaps we may read back into this association beliefs which are quite explicit later on, for if one contrasts the brilliancy and cohesion of new poured glass or metal ingots with the dirty and chaotic pile of ore, ash and sand from which they are made, the change is most striking. It is as though one had transformed a dull, lifeless agglomeration into a living unity. The sparkle of gold and glass had something of the vital spark, visible in the human eye, so that it was not mere fancy to see, in the artificial production of these materials, the creation of something superior, if not actually alive. End quote. Production, in effect, implied not only reproduction, as Eliade has observed for metallurgy, but also animation, not as raw materials bathed in the fire of labour, but as nature actively imbuing its own substance with a vital spark. The spiritized nature of techniques is reflected in a highly suggestive body of possibilities that only recently have entered into our accounts of the history of technology. The original magic of gold, in fact, may justify a more literal interpretation of the metal than we have previously given. Its original attraction is perhaps less a function of its monetary value and rarity than of the fact that it is untarnishable. The metal seems to present a mystical eternality to the flux and change that afflict more mundane objects. Alchemy may have drawn its inspiration from these attributes, well before gold became coinage or the ornamental evidence of wealth and power, it may have been sacred substance that defied the assault of time and the perishability of things. If these speculations are valid, the division of labour between natural arts and artificial crafts, indeed the historic division of labour, indeed the historic division of labour between food cultivation and crafts that underpins the separation of town and country, is haunted by ideological ghosts. The rearing of temples, the fabrication of sacred objects and altars, the ornamentation of deities, the artistry applied to priestly vestments and artefacts. Only later do artificial crafts begin to apply to personal products that satisfy the appetites of ruling classes. After all has been said about the classical world's disdain for labour, I wish to add a qualifying note. In many respects, Hellenic and Roman ideas 
about work score a profound ethical advance over preliterate and early ancient mystical attitudes toward techniques. Claude Mosse reminds us that Odysseus built his own boat, and that Hephaestus, the deity of crafts, spent his life in the red glow of his forge. The ancient world did not despise work as such. The origins of the Greek ideal of free time derive not only from an ideological disdain for the slave and for enslavement, but also from a profound respect for freedom as an activity. Aristotle pointedly observes that the best ordered polis will not make an artisan a citizen. Citizenship will, quote, only belong to those who are released from manual occupations, end quote, and in effect are thereby engaged in the work of managing the polis. It is this latter concept of active citizenship, based on individual autonomy and freedom of judgment, that is central to the Hellenic notion of citizenship. As Mosse correctly observes, Quote, it is not the manual activity of work which makes labour despised, but the ties of dependence which it creates between the artisan and the person who uses the product which he manufactures. End quote. The Hellenic attitude toward labour is conditioned as much by the autonomy of the worker as it is by an association of active citizenship with free time. The ethical principle of autonomy is no less significant than the social and psychological factors to shape the attitude of the polis. Mosse's elaboration of this Greek view toward work is worth citing in more detail. Quote, to build one's own house, one's own ship, or to spin and weave the material which is used to clothe the members of one's own household is in no way shameful, but to work for another man in return for a wage of any kind is degrading. It is this which distinguishes the ancient mentality from a modern, which would have no hesitation in placing the independent artisan above the wage earner. But, for the ancients, there is really no difference between the artisan who sells his own products and the workman who hires out his services. Both work to satisfy the needs of others, not their own. They depend on others for their livelihood. For that reason, they are no longer free. This, perhaps above all, is what distinguishes the artisan from the peasant. The peasant is so much closer to the ideal of self-sufficiency, autarkia, which was the essential basis for man's freedom in the ancient world. Needless to say, in the classical age, in both Greece and Rome, this ideal of self-sufficiency had long since given way to a system of organised trade. However, the archaic mentality endured, and this explains not only the scorn felt for the artisan labouring in his smithy or beneath the scorching sun on building sites, but also the scarcely veiled disdain felt for merchants or for the rich entrepreneurs who live off the labour of their slaves. End quote. By contrast, the farmer earned not only the material independence requisite for a free man, but also the sense of security requisite for a free spirit. He was no client. The classical mind read clientage into vocations that would surprise us today. For example, 
the dependence of wealthy usurers on their debtors, of traders on their buyers, of craftsmen on their customers, and of artists on their admirers. Even though the usurer, trader, and artisan began to preempt the farmer in social power, the tension between reality and ideal, while it finally destroyed the traditional reality, did not destroy the traditional ideal. In fact, agriculture enjoyed cultural eminence in the classical world, not only because it conferred self-sufficiency on its practitioners, but also because it was seen as an ethical activity. Hence, not only a techne. Life in the fields strengthened both the body and soul, Mosse observes. Quote, Love for the soil was an essential ingredient of patriotism. The earth was just and gave her fruits to those who understood how to tend her and who obeyed the injunctions of the gods. Whatever magical practices they resorted to, in order to gain good harvests, they certainly never took the place of the day-to-day -day care the earth needed, and experience was the basis of this knowledge, which was handed down from father to son. But the science of agriculture went no further than an attempt to find better ways of organizing labor. End quote. Food cultivation as a spiritual, indeed religious activity, had not been changed basically by the emergence of the polis and the republican city-state. But it had also been given a moral dimension that was more in accord with the rationalism of the classical world. The secularization of techniques occurred within a context that, while rational and pragmatic, was not strictly rationalistic and scientistic. Initially, religion and later ethics, defined the very functions of technology within society. The use of tools and machines called for a series of explanations that were not only mystical, but also ethical and ecological explanations rather than strictly pragmatic. Were arts authentically natural or not? Were crafts artificial? If so, in what sense? Did they accord with the structure, solidarity and ideology of the community at a later time, when the polis and the republican city-state emerged, more sophisticated parameters for technical change emerged as well? Did technical changes foster the personal autonomy that became so integral to the Hellenic ideal of citizenship and the palpable body politic? Did they foster personal independence? and republican virtue. Viewed from an ecological viewpoint, did they accord with a just earth who gave her fruits to those who understood how to tend her? Here, the concept of an appropriate technology was formulated not in terms of logistics and physical dimensions, but in terms of an ecological ethics that visualized an active nature as just comprehending and generous. Nature abundantly rewarded the food cultivator, or the artisan, who was prepared to function symbiotically in relation to her power of fecundity and her injunctions. Despite the morass of slavery into which the classical world descended, only to be followed by feudal forms of servitude, these ethical distinctions did not disappear. A close association between ethics and techniques persisted throughout medieval society, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Feudal custom and the Protestant ethic dictated a sense of moral responsibility and theological calling toward work and technical change all other social and doctrinal limitations aside. The medieval guilds were not merely occupational associations, they regulated the quality of goods 
according to very distinct canons of fairness and justice, in which biblical precept played as much of a role as economic considerations. Until the enclosure movements of the 16th century turned the English nobility into mere agricultural entrepreneurs, the manorial society over which it presided had an avowedly patronal character. When the nobility began to betray its traditional yeoman clients by replacing them with sheep, the Tudor monarchs from Henry to Elizabeth vigorously sought to arrest this development and became the objects of sharp opprobrium by the landlord and merchant classes of the time. By the late 18th century, England had plummeted recklessly into a brutalising industrial society that advanced terribly meagre ethical criteria for mechanisation. Bentham, as noted earlier, identified the good quantitatively rather than in terms of an abiding sense of right and wrong. Adam Smith, in many ways more of a moralist than an economist, saw good in terms of self-interest governed by a vague rule of justice. From an ethical viewpoint, the displaced yeomanry and the new working classes were simply abandoned to their fate if the emerging factory system stunted its human operatives, to use the language of the day, if it shortened their lives appallingly, fostering pandemics like tuberculosis and cholera, the new English manufacturing class advanced no weighty ethical imperatives for the human disasters it produced, beyond some hazy commitment to progress, so-called. The British ruling elite may have been sanctimonious, but it was often blissfully lacking in hypocrisy, as the writings of one of its greatest theorists, David Ricardo, has revealed. Progress, so-called, was unabashedly identified with egotism, the classical ideal of autonomy and independence, with free competition, so-called. English industrialists were never infused with a spirit of republican virtue, nor, for that matter, were the ideologists of the French Revolution, despite all their mimicking of Roman postures and phraseology. Neither Adam Smith on one side of the channel, nor Robespierre on the other, identified their ethical views with the existence of an independent yeoman class whose capacity for citizenship was a function of their autonomy. Both spokesmen were oriented ideologically toward vague notions of natural liberty that found their expression in freedom from government. Smith, or a tyranny of freedom, Rousseau, that took the form of a highly centralised state. It was actually in America, and perhaps there alone, that republican virtue most closely approximated the classical ideal, a living federalism, which was not significantly diluted until the latter half of the 19th century, provided the soil for a stunning variety of political institutions and economic relationships. To be sure, this rich galaxy of forms included the slaveocracy of the southern states, institutions and ideologies for the genocidal occupation of Indian lands, and a barely concealed system of peonage involving not only indentured servitude during the colonial period, but the plantation economy that came with the expropriation of Mexican territories. But New England political life was organised around the face-to-face -face democracy of the town meeting and around considerable county and statewide autonomy.
an incredibly loose democracy and mutualism prevailed along a frontier that was often beyond the reach of the comparatively weak national government. Permeating this relatively democratic world was an intense republican ideology that provided the ethical context of American technical development for generations after the revolution. Although it is commonplace to cite Jefferson as this ideology's most articulate spokesman, we must often be reminded how closely his views approximated the classical ideal and how deeply they affected American technical development. In his famous Notes on the State of Virginia of 1785, Jefferson's association of republican virtue with the natural arts of agriculture and an autonomous yeoman class reads like a strident passage from Cicero's De Officis. Quote, Those who labour in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire, which otherwise might escape from the face of the earth. Corruption of morals in a mass of cultivators is a phenomenon of which no age nor nation has furnished an example. It is the mark set on those who not looking up to heaven to their own soil and industry, as does the husbandman for their subsistence, depend for it on the casualties and caprice of customers. Dependence begets subservience and venality, suffocates the germ of virtue, and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. End quote. Jefferson's concern for the independence of a republican body politic renders this passage strikingly unique. 18th century European political economists, like the physiocrats, had also given primacy to the natural arts, notably to agriculture over manufactures, but they had done so more as a source of wealth rather than because of social morality. Jefferson's emphasis on agriculture is largely ethical. It is anchored not only in the virtues of husbandry as a technical calling, but in a farmer as an independent citizen. By contrast, the mobs of the great cities are corrupted by their clientage, self-interest and lascivious appetites. They lack the industry, virtue and moral cohesion that is necessary for freedom and stable republican institutions. Nor was Jefferson alone in this ethical stance. Similar views were echoed, although far less fervently, by John Adams as early as the 1780s, and even by Benjamin Franklin, whose favourable view of the artificial crafts was that of a highly urbanised republican artisan, of a printer turned propagandist. For our purposes, what makes Jefferson's views unique is the extent to which he exalted the virtues of nature as such. He speaks to us not only in the traditional language of natural law, but in a more aesthetic vernacular that reveals his appreciation of the mutual enhancement of the natural world and labour. The biblical injunction of hard labour in the fields as penance is replaced by an ecological vision of virtuous labour as freedom. The husbandman looking up to heaven or down to his own soil is the imagery of ecology, not of political economy. But we soon encounter a remarkable paradox. Once this fervently republican tradition is extended beyond an agricultural society, peopled by self-sufficient farmers, it contains the seeds for its own negation. Perhaps even more striking, this tradition provides a basis not only for the absorption of the natural arts by the artificial crafts, but also for the total mechanization of personal and social life. Neither Jefferson nor the agrarian populists of his day 
could have prevented the growth of manufactures in the new world, nor could they present a strong ideological case against the increase of non-agricultural pursuits. Indeed, Jefferson, the president, was significantly different from Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence. If the vitality of the republic, conceived as a body politic, depended upon the independence and autonomy of its yeomanry, then the vitality of the republic, conceived as a nation, depended upon the independence and autonomy of its economy. An agrarian America that required industrial goods could hardly hope to retain its republican integrity if it remained a mere client of European industry. It followed logically that America had to develop its own industrial base in order to maintain its own sense of republican virtue. Here lay the conditions for a supremely ironical development in the relation of ethics to techniques. To preserve its secular ethics, American Republican ideology had to accept a course of technical development that threatened to vitiate its own classical premises. The nation could not become autonomous without rendering its own body politic of self-sufficient yeomen increasingly heteronomous. To cease to be a client of English industry, America required an industry of its own, with its consequent rationalization of labor and its use of scientific principles to devise sophisticated instruments of production. Jefferson had never seen English factory towns and the squalor they produced. His unruly urban mobs were largely artisans and small retailers. Yet even this modest level of economic development sufficed to disquiet them. The emergence of the factory raised even more thundering problems. Visitors to England during the first half of the 19th century returned to their respective homelands with horrendous accounts of the filth, the disease and the demoralization of the working classes that accompanied the new industrial system. In the 1830s, the Tocqueville told the French about Manchester, this new Hades, quote-unquote, with its, quote, heaps of dung, rubble from buildings, putrid stagnant pools, the noise of furnaces, the whistle of steam, and the vast structures enshrouded in black smoke that keep air and light out of the human habitations which they dominate. End quote. A decade later, Engels gave the Germans an even more detailed, vivid account of England's chief industrial city. Still another decade later, Dickens described the situation to his more fortunate countrymen in the well-to-do parts of the country. To build a large factory complex in the new United States meant little more than to place classical Republican ethics on the rack. How could Yankee merchant entrepreneurs, whose parents and grandparents had presumably risked their lives and fortunes for the Republican ideal, hope to decorate a relatively sophisticated industrial system with the garlands of Republican virtue. The ideal itself had to be modified without overly abusing its form, which itself had to be significantly altered without seeming to lose its surface attributes. Accordingly, the concern for the autonomy of the body politic, with its world of free farmers, had to be transferred to a concern for the autonomy of the nation with its world of free entrepreneurs. This problem was to become a central theme of American social life for more than a century after Jefferson's death. It recurs to this day as a cultural reflex against an increasingly centralized and bureaucratic society. Republican virtue 
viewed as a human good, had to be depersonalized, generalized, and finally objectified into Republican virtue viewed as an institutional good. This change in emphasis was decisive. Where Jefferson had placed the locus of his ethics in a family worked farm, independent and strong in its commitments to independence, the new merchant entrepreneurs placed the locus of their ethics in an industrial community worked by hired, robotized hands. The autonomy of the republic, in effect, was purchased at the expense of its republicans. This shrewd dehumanization of ethics into a mere stratagem for material gain assumed a highly sinister form. If the republic now began to supplant its republicans, its sense of virtue, so-called, persisted, but now as a discipline rather than an ideal. As John F. Casson had noted in an excellent study of technology and American Republican values, a decisive step in achieving this shift in emphasis occurred in the 1820s, when a group of Boston merchant entrepreneurs built the earliest American industrial complex at what was to be called Lowell, Massachusetts. Francis Cabot Lowell, who conceived this textile manufacturing complex and provided it posthumously with his name, also furnished it with an ethical rationale, its initial design and its ubiquitous criteria of discipline. As Casson observes, quote, Previous American factory settlements had retained the English system of hiring whole families, often including school-age children. Lowell and his associates opposed the idea of a long-term residential force that might lead to an entrenched proletariat. They planned to hire as their main working force young single women from the surrounding area for a few years apiece. For a rotating force such as this, women were an obvious choice. Able-bodied men could be attracted from farming only with difficulty, and their hiring would raise fears that the nation might lose her agrarian character and promote resistance to manufactures. Women, on the other hand, had traditionally served as spinners and weavers when textiles had been produced in the home, and they constituted an important part of the family economy. End quote. Here, piety and pastoralism formed a perfect fit with profit and productivity. The women were expected to be docile, raised in a Puritan tradition that preached a message of self-discipline, hard work, obedience and salvation. Their sense of virtue was homebred and merely required paternal surveillance. On this score, the Lowell mill owners used their concept of republican ideals in an unprecedentedly expansive manner. The factory system's demands for order and hierarchy were introduced into every aspect of the employee's living situation. The first manufacturing complex, which opened in September 1823, consisted of six factory buildings, grouped in a spacious quadrangle bordering the river and landscape with flowers, trees and shrubs. The greenery that surrounded Lowell and its buildings not only imparted the appropriate pastoral setting for a classical republican community, but also insulated its employees from large towns with their unruly mobs and insidious political ideas. The factory buildings, in turn, were, quote, dominated by a central mill, crowned with a Georgian cupola, made of brick with flat plain walls, and white granite lintels above each window space. 
The factories presented a neat, orderly and efficient appearance, which symbolised the institution's goals and would be emulated by many of the penitentiaries, insane asylums, orphanages and reformatories of the period. Beyond the counting house, at the entrance to the mill yard, stretched the company dormitories. Their arrangements reflected a federalist image of proper social structure. The factory population of Lowell was rigidly defined into four groups, and their hierarchy was immutably preserved in the town's architecture. End quote. A Georgian mansion directly above the original factory in Lowell symbolised the authority of the complex's manager. Beneath the company agent, quote, stood the overseers, who lived in a simple yet substantial quarters at the ends of the rows of boarding houses where the operatives resided, thus providing a second measure of surveillance. In the boarding houses themselves lived the female workers who outnumbered male employees three to one. Originally, these apartments were constructed in rows of double houses, at least 30 girls to a unit, with intervening strips of lawn. End quote. Later, as the company expanded, the apartments were strung together, quote, blocking both light and air. These quarters intended to serve intentionally as dormitories and offered a few amenities beyond dining rooms and bedrooms, each of the latter shared by as many as six to eight girls, two to a bed. End quote. Although Lowell's textile technology belongs to the beginnings of the industrial system, its obsessive concern with surveillance and discipline was eerily in advance of its time. It reveals with startling clarity the implications of the factory as a unique form of social organisation, an issue that only recently has come to the foreground of institutional discourse. Lowell did not merely exploit its workers, it sought to totally recondition them. Its surveillance system may seem particularly crude today, but at the time it was highly effective in reshaping the very outlook of naive country folk. Quote, the factory as a whole was governed by the superintendent, his office strategically placed between the boarding houses and the mills at the entrance to the mill yard. From this point, as one spokesman enthusiastically reported, his mind regulates all, his character inspires all, his plans matured and decided by the directors of the company who visit him every week control all. Beneath his watchful eye, in each room of the factory, an overseer stood responsible for the work, conduct and proper management of the operatives therein. In addition, corporate authorities relied upon the factory girls to act as moral police over one another. The ideal, as described by an unofficial spokesman of the corporation, represented a tyranny of the majority that would have made de Tocqueville shudder. End quote. Theoretically, at least, the mere suspicion of moral behavioural improprieties led to ostracism until the suspected operative, shunned by her co-workers on the streets of the town, on the job and in the boarding houses, was reduced to an outcast. Eventually, the victim of this unrelenting social pressure would be forced to leave the community. It would be simplistic to dismiss Lowell as an industrial penitentiary, a blight among many that marked the onset of the Industrial Revolution in America. As with the factory system in England, one of the primary functions of such highly supervised working conditions was to regularise labour, to standardise it, and to govern its rhythms by the tick of the clock 
and the tempo of the machine. But Lowell was also a uniquely American phenomenon. Ideologically, it had been reared on the basis of a distinct Republican ethic that related techniques to lofty concepts of citizenship. In practice, however, it dramatically demonstrated how ethics could be dismembered by technology, indeed absorbed into it. Values that had stemmed from a long tradition of human rationality became not only dehumanized, but also rationalized. Not only instruments in the service of industrial exploitation, but also sources of social regimentation. Far from being a phase in an early industrial development, like the unfeeling factory town of Manchester, Lowell was in many ways far ahead of its time. As early as the 1820s, when small-scale agriculture and family-type artisanship were still predominant in American society, an industrial entity had emerged that, in the very sense of the domestic republican ideals, thoroughly industrialized every detail of a community's personal life. Lowell had created not only a society of artificial crafts, but also a cosmos of industrial hierarchy and discipline. Nothing was spared from these industrial attributes, not dress, food, entertainment, reading matter, leisure time, sexuality, or demeanor. As Casson notes, the, quote, cupolas which crowned Lowell's mills were not simply ornamental, their bells insistently reminded workers the time was money. Operatives worked a six-day week, approximately 12 hours a day, and bells told them awake and to their jobs. Lateness was severely punished, to and from meals, curfew, and bed. End quote. Although Lowell was to fade away as a model industrial community, its legacy never disappeared. Such a highly regulated world did not reappear in the United States until the 1950s, albeit in the pastel colours favoured by social engineers and reinforced less by brute surveillance than by the subtle arts of industrial psychology. But these new techniques were effective because Lowell and its successors had done their job well. The dissociation of traditional Republican ethics from techniques was complete. By the 1950s, the factory system and market had begun to invade the last bastions of private life and had colonized personality itself. No overseers and superintendents were needed to perform this task. Reinforced by rationality as a mode of instrumentalism and science as a value-free discipline. The Lowells of our own era have ceased to be an extrinsic feature of social mechanization. They arose imminently from the factory system as a way of life and the marketplace as a mode of human consociation. Technics no longer had to pretend that it had an ethical context. It had become the vital spark of society itself. In the face of this massive development, no private refuge was available, no town or frontier to which one could flee, no cottage to which one could retreat. Management ceased to be a form of administration and literally became a way of life. Ironically, republican virtue was not completely discarded. It was simply transmuted from an ideal into a technique. Autonomy was reworked to mean competition, individuality to mean egotism, fortitude to mean moral indifference, 
enterprise to mean the pursuit of profit, and federalism to mean free trade. The ethic spawned by the American Revolution was simply eviscerated, leaving behind a hollow shell for ceremonial exploitation. As it turned out, it was not the hideous squalor of a Manchester that placed a lasting imprint on the industrial age, but the clinical sophistication of bureaucratic disempowerment and media manipulation. What is most chilling about the ambiguities of freedom, of reason, science and techniques, is that we now take their existence for granted. We have been taught to regard these ambiguities as part of the human condition, with the result that they merely coexist with each other rather than confront each other. We are becoming deadened to the contradictions they pose, their relationship to each other in contemporary life and the history of ideas, and the harsh logic that must eventually assert itself when one element of these ambiguities asserts itself over the other. Our intellectual neutrality toward reason and rationalism, science and scientism, and ethics and techniques creates not only confusion about the notion of paradox as such, but also a misbegotten freedom to alternate flippantly between both sides of the ambiguity, or worse yet, to mindlessly occupy utterly conflicting positions simultaneously. The social and ecological problems of our time will not allow us to delay indefinitely in formulating a sound outlook and practice. The individual elements of these ambiguities of freedom have acquired a life of their own, all the more because our neutrality fosters abstention and withdrawal. The continuing substitution of rationalism for reason, of scientism for science, and of techniques for ethics threatens to remove our very sense of the problems that exist, not to speak of our ability to resolve them. A look at techniques alone reveals that the car is racing at an increasing pace, with nobody in the driver's seat. Accordingly, commitment and insight have never been more needed than they are today. Whether or not the time is too late, I will not venture to say. Neither pessimism nor optimism have any meaning in the face of the commanding imperatives that confront us. What must be understood is that the ambiguities of freedom are not intractable problems, that there are ways of resolving them. The reconstruction of reason as an interpretation of the world must begin with a review of the modern premises of rationalism, its commitment to insight through opposition. This oppositional commitment, common to objective and subjective reason alike, casts all otherness in stringently antithetical terms. Understanding as such depends upon our ability to control what is to be understood, or more radically, to conquer it, subjugate it, efface it, or absorb it. Like the Marxian vision of labour, reason is said to establish its very identity through its powers of negativity and sovereignty, an atavistic rationalism of the kind so endearing to both German idealism and American pragmatism, is a rationalism of conquest, not of reconciliation, of intellectual predation, not of intellectual symbiosis. That there are phenomena in our world that must be conquered, indeed disgorged, 
for example, domination, exploitation, rule, cruelty, and indifference to suffering, needs hardly to be emphasized. But that otherness, per se, is intrinsically comprehended in oppositional terms, also biases that comprehension in the direction of instrumentalism, for hidden within a dialectic of strict negativity are the philosophical tricks for using power as a predominant mode of comprehension. Just as we can justifiably distinguish between an authoritarian and a libertarian techniques, so too can we distinguish between authoritarian and libertarian modes of reason. This distinction is no less decisive for thought and its history than it is for technology. The creatively reproductive form we wish to impart to a new ecological community requires the mediation of a libertarian reason, one that bears witness to the symbiotic animism of early preliterate sensibilities without becoming captive to its myths and self-deceptions. Even though animals have not been persuaded by rituals and ceremonials to seek out their hunter, we would do well to respect the animals and plants we consume by using an etiquette, perhaps even ceremonies, that acknowledge their integrity and subjectivity as living beings. For here, nature has offered up a sacrifice to us that demands some kind of recompense in turn, even an aesthetic one. Nor are we alone the participants and audience for that ceremonial. Life surrounds us everywhere and, in its own way, bears witness to ours. Our habitat, in effect, is not merely a place in which we happen to live, it is also a form of natural conscience. The symbiotic rationality, I have called libertarian, is a ubiquitous presence, a sensibility, a state of mind, not merely a cerebral series of thoughts. To harvest life and feed on it unthinkingly is to diminish the sense of life within us as well as the reality of life around us. Denied its aesthetics and ceremonials, an ecological sensibility becomes a mere pretense at what we so flippantly call ecological thinking, or, to use the sleazy formula of one prominent environmentalism, the notion that there is no free lunch in nature. Libertarian rationality does not include lunches or snacks in its vision of ecological balance. It is a redefinition of otherness, not simply as a thou, but as the very way by which we relate to beings apart from ourselves. Our approach to all the particulars that constitute nature is as intrinsic to a libertarian rationality as the images we form of them in our minds. Hence, it is a practice as well as an outlook, how we till the soil or plant and harvest its produce. Indeed, how we walk across a meadow or through a forest is coextensive with the rationality we bring to the environments we are trying to comprehend. The other, to be sure, is never us. It is apart from us just as surely as we are apart from it. In Western philosophy, particularly in its Hegelian forms, this fact has inexorably locked otherness as such into various concepts of alienation. Leaving Hegelian interpreters aside, however, any serious reading of Hegel's works reveals that he was never fully comfortable with his own notion of the other. Alienation conceived as Entsaurung is not similar to alienation conceived 
as Zebstentiserum. The former, favoured by Marx, views otherness, specifically the products of human labour, as an antagonistic mode of objectification that asserts itself above and against the worker. By no means does Marx confine Entauserung to capitalism. It also emerges in humanity's intercourse with nature, since under natural conditions, even cooperative labour, in Marx's view, quote, is not voluntary but natural, not as the workers' united power, but as an alien force existing outside of them, and which they therefore cannot control, but which, on the contrary, passes through its own power series of phases and stages independent of man, even appearing to govern his will and action. End quote. Hence, entauserung, in the antagonistic sense of estrangement, is coextensive with humanity's embeddedness in nature, another example of Marx's atrocious misreadings of so-called savage society, and can be annulled only by its conquest of nature. In Hegel's mature ontology, alienation as otherness is the Sebstentauserung, or self-detachment of spirit, the unfolding concretization of its potentialities into self-consciousness. Self-detachment is not committed to antagonism as much as it is to wholeness, fullness and completeness. Although Hegel's emphasis on negativity can never be denied, he repeatedly weakens its asperity. For example, in his vision of true love. In love, the separate does still remain, he wrote in his youthful years, but as something united and no longer as something separate. Life in the subject senses life in the object. This sense of detachment as a unity in diversity, runs through the entire Hegelian dialectic, as certainly as does its sweeping spirit of antithesis. Hegel's concept of transcendence, Aufhebung, never advances a notion of outright annihilation. Its negativity consists of annulling the other in order to absorb it into a movement toward a richly variegated completeness. But Hegel's work of alienation is strictly theoretical. If we remain with him too long, we risk trying to explore different forms of reason in purely speculative terms. Reason, as I have emphasised, has its own natural and social history that provides a better means of resolving its paradoxes than does a strictly intellectual strategy. It also has its own anthropology, which reveals an approach to otherness that is based more on symbiosis and conciliation than detachment and opposition. The formation of the human mind is separable from the socialization of human nature at birth and its early period of development. However significant biology may be in shaping the human nervous system and its acuity, it is ultimately the gradual introduction of the newborn infant to culture that gives reason its specifically human character. We must turn to this early formative process to find the germinal conditions for a new libertarian mode of rationality and the sensibility that will infuse it. Biology and socialization, in fact, conjoin precisely at the point where maternal care is the most formative factor in childhood acculturation. Biology is obviously important because the neural equipment of human beings 
to think symbolically and to generalize well beyond the capacity of most primates is a tangible physical endowment. The newborn infant faces a long period of biological dependency, which not only allows for a greater mental plasticity in acquiring knowledge, but also provides time in which to develop strong social ties with its parents, siblings, and some kind of rudimentary community. No less important is the form of the socialization process itself, which intimately shapes the mentality and sensibility of the young. Reason comes to the child primarily through the care, support, attention, and instruction provided by the mother. Robert Bruffo, in his pioneering work on the matriarchal origins of society, accurately depicts this anthropology of reason. He observes that the, quote, one known factor which establishes a profound distinction between the constitution of the most rudimentary human group and all other animal groups is the association of mother and offspring, which is the sole form of true social solidarity among animals. Throughout the class of mammals, there is a continuous increase in the duration of that association, which is the consequence of the prolongation of the period of infantile dependence, and is correlated with a concomitant protraction of gestation and the advance in intelligence and social instincts. End quote. We may reasonably question whether the mother infant relationship is the quote, sole form of true social solidarity among animals, end quote, particularly in the case of primates, which have a surprisingly large repertoire of relationships. But had Briffo emphasized that the mother-infant relationship is the initial step in the socialization process, the cradle in which the need for consociation is created, he would have been accurate. The role of this relationship in shaping human thought processes and sensibilities is nothing less than monumental, particularly in matricentric cultures where it encompasses most of childhood life. In many respects, civilization involves a massive enterprise to undo the impact of maternal care, nurture and modes of thought on the character structure of the offspring. The imagery of growing up has actually come to mean growing away from a maternal domestic world of mutual support, concern, and love, a venerable and highly workable society in its own right, into one made shapeless, unfeeling, and harsh, to accommodate humanity to war, exploitation, political obedience, and rule involves the undoing not only of human first nature as an animal, but also of human second nature as a child who lives in dependency and protective custody under the eyes and in the arms of its mother. What we so facilely call maturity is not ordinarily an ethically desirable process of growth and humanization. To become an autonomous, perceptive, experienced and competent adult involves terms that historically possess very mixed meanings. These terms become very misleading if they are not explicated in light of the social, ethical, economic and psychological goals we have in mind. The child's growth away from the values of a caring mother toward autonomy and independence becomes a cultural travesty and a psychological disaster when it results in a youth's degrading dependency upon the caprices 
of an egotistical and unfeeling taskmaster. Neither the youth's autonomy nor its character structure benefit by maturity in this form. Dickens's account of Oliver Twist is not a study of the growth of a child's capacity to cope as he develops from life in a 19th century orphanage to survival in the Wens of London. Rather, it is a study of a dehumanising society that tends to destroy whatever sense of sympathy, care and solidarity is woven into its character structure by maternal love. By contrast, the so-called primitive Hopi children are in an immensely enviable position when they find many mothers to succour them and many loving relations to instruct them. They acquire a much greater social gift than so-called independence, which modern capitalism has redefined to mean rugged egotism. Indeed, Hopi children acquire the all-important gift of interdependence, in which individual and community support each other without negating the values of kindness, solidarity and mutual respect that become the child's psychic inheritance and birthright. This heritage is formed not only by maternal care and nurture, but also by a very specific rationality that often is concealed within the maudlin term mother love. For it is not only love that the mother ordinarily gives her child, but a rationality of otherness that stands sharply at odds with its modern arrogant counterpart. The earlier rationality is unabashedly symbiotic. Fromm's evocation of mother love as a spontaneous, unconditional sentiment of caring, free from any reciprocating obligations by the child, yields more than the total de-objectification of person that I emphasised earlier. Mother love also yields a rationality of de-objectification that is almost universal in character, indeed a re-subjectification of experience that sees the other within a logical nexus of mutuality. The other becomes the active component that it always has been in natural and social history, not simply the alien and alienated, that is in Marxian theory and the dead matter that is in classical physics. I have deliberately emphasised the word symbiotic in describing this libertarian rationality. The dual meaning of this ecological term is important. Symbiosis includes not only mutualism, but also Parasitism. A libertarian rationality is not unconditional in its observations, like mother love. Indeed, to deny any preconditions for judging experience is naive and myopic. But its preconditions for observation differ from an authoritarian rationalism structured around estrangement and ultimately around command and obedience. In a libertarian rationality, observation is always located within an ethical context that defines the good and is structured around a self-detachment, to use Hegel's term, that leads toward wholeness, completeness and fullness, although more in an ecological rather than Hegel's metaphysical sense. A libertarian rationality raises natural ecology's tenet of unity in diversity to the level of reason itself. It evokes a logic of unity between the I 
and the other that recognizes the stabilizing and integrative function of diversity, of a cosmos of others that can be comprehended and integrated symbiotically. Diversity and unity do not contradict each other as logical antinomies. To the contrary, unity is the form of diversity, the pattern that gives it intelligibility and meaning, and hence a unifying principle not only of ecology but of reason itself. A libertarian rationality that emphasizes the unity of otherness is not a logic of surrender, passivity, and sentimentality, as Jacob Bachefen in his work Das Mutterrecht, Mother Right, imputed to mother love and matriarchy more than a century ago. Symbiosis, as I have already observed, does not deny the existence of a harmful parasitism that can destroy its host. A libertarian rationality must acknowledge the existence of an other that is itself blatantly antagonistic and oppositional. Actually, the ability to manipulate nature and to function actively in natural and social history is a desideratum, not an evil. But human activity is expected to occur within an ethical context of virtue, not a value-free context of utility and efficiency. There is a natural and social history of mentalism that objectively validates our concept of the good. Our very ability to form such concepts from the vast reservoir of natural development in all its gradations and forms derives from this natural history of subjectivity. Humanity, as part of this natural history, has the intrinsic right to participate in it. As a unique agent of consciousness, humanity can provide the voice of nature's internal rationality in a form of thought and self-reflective action. Libertarian reason seeks to consciously mitigate ecological destruction in the realms of both social ecology and natural ecology. Actually, the formal structure of dialectical and analytical reason would require very little alteration to accommodate a libertarian rationality. What would have to change decisively, however, is the overwhelming orientation of rational canons towards control, manipulation, domination and estrangement that collectively bias authoritarian rationalism. Libertarian reason would advance a contrasting view in its orientation toward ecological symbiosis, but doubtless this can be regarded as a bias that is neither more nor less justifiable than the bias of authoritarian rationalism. But biases are not formed from mere air. Not only do they always exist in every orientation we hold, but their impact upon thought is all the more insidious when their existence is denied in the name of objectivity and a value-free epistemology. It is not the interplay between abstract intellectual categories to which we must turn in order to validate the assumptions behind all our views. It is to experience itself, to natural and social history, that we must turn to test these assumptions, not only in nature, but also in maternal care, in the very cradle of human consociation itself. Do we find a human second nature that is structured around nurture, support and the de-objectified world of experience, rather than a world guided by domination, self-interest 
and exploitation. It is in this social cradle that the most fundamental canons of reason are formed. The story of reason in the history of civilization is not an account of the sophistication of this germinal rationality along libertarian lines. It is a vast political and psychological enterprise to brutally extirpate this rationality in the interest of domination, to supplant it by the third nature of authority and rule. This fetid word modernity and its confusion of personal atomization with individuality may well demarcate an era in which the cradle of reason has finally been demolished. A new science that accords with libertarian reason, in turn, has a responsibility of rediscovering the concrete, which is so important in arresting this enterprise. Ironically, paradigms that quarrel with paradigms, each blissfully remote from the natural history and ecological reality in which they should be immersed, increasingly serve the ends of instrumentalism with its inevitable manipulation of mind and society. Paradoxical as it may seem, the abstraction of science to methodology, which is largely what scientific paradigms do, tends to turn the scientific project itself into a problem of method, or more bluntly, a problem of instrumental strategies. The confusion between science as knowledge, or Wissenschaft, and as scientific method, has never been adequately unscrambled. Since Francis Bacon's time, the identification of scientific verification with science itself has given a priority to technique over reality and has fostered the tendency to reduce our comprehension of reality to a matter of mere methodology. To recover the supremacy of the concrete with its rich wealth of qualities, differentia and solidity over and beyond a transcendental concept of science as method is to slap the face of an arrogant intellectualism with the ungloved hand of reality. Plagued as we are today by a neo-Kantian dualism and transcendentalism that has given mind a life of its own, supplanting the reality of history with a mentalized myth of historical stages, the reality of society with flow diagrams, and the reality of communication with meta-communication, the recovery of the concrete is an enterprise not simply involving intellectual ventilation, but also intellectual detoxification. Whatever we may think of Paul Fireband's intellectualized version of anarchism, we may well treasure his work. He has opened the windows of modern science to the fresh air of reality. Science must become the many sciences that make up its own history, from animism to nuclear physics. It must therefore respond to the many voices emitted by natural history. But these voices speak the language of the facts that constitute nature at different levels of its development. They are concrete and detailed. It is their very diversity as concretes that make the organization of substance a drama of ever more complex forms of molecular self-organization, to use the language of biochemistry. To recognize the specificity of these facts, their uniqueness as forms in enriching the enterprise of knowledge, is not to reduce science to a crude empiricism that replaces the scientist's need to generalize. Generalizations that seek to elude these concretes by fettering them to purely intellectual criteria of truth and scientific method 
To garner what is quantitative in reality at the expense of what is qualitative is to reject as archaic the paradigms, a vast heritage of truth whose value often lies in its richer, more qualitative view of reality. Even natural ecology has not been immune to disorientation. It is already paying a severe penalty in its once promising range of scope for its attempts to gain scientific credibility by surrendering its respect for the qualitative uniqueness of each ecosystem and instead describing the ecosystem in terms of energy values and flow diagrams. Reductionism and systems theory have scored yet another triumph. Hence, one of the key problems of science still lingers on. The scientist must approach nature for what it really is, active, developmental, emergent, and deliciously variegated in its wealth of specificity and form. Finally, techniques must reinfuse its artificial crafts with its natural arts by bringing natural processes back into techne as much as possible. I refer not just to the traditional need to integrate agriculture with industry, but to the need to change our very concept of industry. The use of the Latin term industria to mean primarily a contrivance or device rather than diligence is of comparatively recent vintage. Today, the word industry has become almost synonymous with production, organized around machines and their products or manufacturers. Industry and its machines in turn foster a very special public orientation. We see them as rationally arranged largely self-operating instruments conceived and designed by the human mind that are meant to shape, form and transform raw materials or natural resources. The steel, glass, rubber, copper and plastic materials that are turned into motor vehicles. The water and chemical ingredients that are turned into Coca-Cola. Even the wood that is turned into mass produced furnishings, and the flesh that is turned into hamburgers. All are regarded merely as manufacturers, the products of industry. In their finished form, these products bear no resemblance to the ores, minerals, vegetation or animals from which they were derived. Assembled or packaged, they are transmuted results of processes that reflect not the sources, but the mere background of their constituent materials. The craftsperson of antiquity continually added a natural dimension to the products of his or her artificial crafts, say, by carving the legs of couches to look like animal limbs or painting statues with sensuous colours. But what little artistry modern industry adds to its products is explicitly geometric and antinatural. More precisely, inorganic in its passion for the honesty of the transmuted materials with which it functions. This extraordinary, indeed pathological, disjunction of nature from its manufactured results stems from a largely mythic interpretation of techniques. The products of modern industry are literally denatured. As such, they become mere objects to be consumed or enjoyed. They exhibit no association with the natural world from which they derive. In the public mind, a product is more intimately associated with the company that manufactured it than with the natural world that made its very existence and production possible. A car is a Datsun or a Chevrolet, not a vehicle that comes from ores, minerals, trees and animal hides. A hamburger is a Big Mac, not the remains of an animal 
that once ranged a distant region of grasslands. Packaging obscures the corn and wheat fields of the Midwest behind the labels of the Del Monte General Foods and Pepperidge Farm Corporations. Indeed, when we say that a product, food, or even therapy is natural, we usually mean that it is pure or unadulterated, not that it comes from nature. What this orientation or lack of orientation reveals is not merely that advertising and media have imprinted corporate names on our minds with a view toward guiding our preferences and purchasing power. Perhaps more significantly, the actual fabrication of the product, from mine, farm and forest to factory, mill and chemical plants, has reduced the entire technical process to a mystery. In the archaic sense, mystery was once seen as a mystical, divinely inspired process, for example, metallurgy. But the mystery surrounding modern production is more mundane. We simply do not know, beyond our own narrow sphere of experience, how the most ordinary things we use are produced. So complete is the disjunction between production and consumption, between farm and factory, not to speak of between factory and consumer, that we are literally the unknowing clients of a stupendous industrial apparatus into which we have little insight and over which we have no control. But this apparatus is itself the client of a vastly complex natural world, which it rarely comprehends in terms that are strictly technical. We think of nature as a non-human industrial apparatus. It fabricates products in some vaguely understood manner that we treat as an industrial phenomenon with our extensive use of agricultural chemicals, our whaling and fishing marine factories, our mechanical slaughtering devices and our denaturing of entire continental regions to mere factory departments. We commonly verbalize this industrial conception of nature in the language of mechanics, electronics, and cybernetics. Our description of the non-human or natural processes as regulated by negative feedback or as systems into which we plug our inputs and outputs reflects the way we have freaked the natural world, to use Paul Shepard's vivid term to meet the ends of industrial domination. What is most important about our denaturing of natural phenomena is that we are its principal victims. We become the objects that our industry most effectively controls. We are its victims because we are unconscious of the way, both technically and psychologically, in which industry controls us. Techne, as mystery has returned again, but not as a process in which the agriculturist or craftsperson totally participates in a mystically enchanted process. We do not participate in a modern industrial process, except as minutely specialised agents. Hence, we are unaware of how the process occurs, much less able to exercise any degree of control over it. When we say that modern industry has become too complex, we normally mean that our knowledge, skills, insights and traditions for growing or fabricating our means of life have been usurped by a stupendous, often meaningless, social machinery that renders us unable to cope with the most elementary imperatives of life. But it is not the complexity of machinery that inhibits our ability to deal with these imperatives. It is the new rules of the game that we call an industrial society that, by restructuring our very lives, has interposed itself between the powers of human rationality and those of nature's fecundity. Most Westerners ordinarily cannot plant and harvest a garden, fell a tree and shape it to meet their needs for shelter, 
reduce ores and cast metals, kill and dress animals for food and hides, or preserve food and other perishables. These elementary vulnerabilities result not from any intrinsic complexity that must exist to provide us with the means of life, but from an ignorance of the means of sustaining life. An ignorance that has been deliberately fostered by a system of industrial clientage. The factory was not born from a need to integrate labour with modern machinery. On the contrary, this building block of what we call industrial society arose from a need to rationalise the labour process, to intensify and exploit it more effectively than employers could ever hope to achieve with early cottage industries based on a self-regulated system of artisanship. Sidney Pollard, quoting an observer of the pre-factory era, notes that workers who were free to regulate their own time as domestic craftspersons rarely worked the modern eight-hour day and five-day week. The weavers were used to play frequently all day on Monday and the greater part of Tuesday and work very late on Thursday night and frequently all night on Friday to ready their cloth for the Saturday market day. This irregularity or naturalness in the rhythm and intensity of traditional systems of work contributed more toward the bourgeoisie's craze for social control and its savagely anti-naturalistic outlook than did the prices or earnings demanded by its employees more than any single technical factor. This irregularity led to the rationalisation of labour under a single ensemble of rule to a discipline of work and regulation of time that yielded the modern factory, often with none of the technical developments we impute to the Industrial Revolution. Before the steam engine, power loom and flying shuttle came into use, indeed, before some of these machines were even invented, the traditional spinning wheel, hand loom and dyeing vat that once filled the working areas of cottages were assembled in large sheds primarily to mobilise the workers themselves, to regulate them harshly and to intensify the exploitation of their labour. Hence, the initial goal of the factory was to dominate labour and destroy the workers' independence from capital. The loss of this independence included the loss of the workers' contact with food cultivation. English parliamentary legislation in the late 17th century acknowledged that, quote, custom hath been retained time out of mind, and that there should be a cessation of weaving every year in the time of harvest, end quote so that spinners and weavers could use their time chiefly employed in harvest work. As soon as the early 19th century, this practice was sufficiently widespread to warrant a comment in the Manchester Chronicle that many weavers could be expected to help in the late summer and early autumn harvesting operations on farms near the city. The periodic shifting of workers from factories to fields should hardly be taken as an act of bucolic generosity on the part of England's ruling class. Until the 1830s, English landlords still held a political edge over the industrial bourgeoisie. Workers who left factories during harvest seasons to work in the countryside were merely transported from one realm of exploitation to another but it was intrinsically important for them to retain their agrarian skills, skills that their children and grandchildren were later to lose completely. To live in a cottage, whether as an artisan or a factory worker, often meant to cultivate a family garden, possibly to pasture a cow, to prepare one's own bread, and to have the skills for keeping a home in good repair. To utterly erase these skills and means of livelihood from the workers' life became an industrial imperative. 
The workers' complete dependence on the factory and on an industrial labour market was a compelling precondition for the triumph of industrial society. Urban planning, such as it was, together with urban congestion, long working hours, a generous moral disregard for working class alcoholism, and a highly specialised division of labour, melded the needs of exploitation to a deliberate policy of proletarianization. The need to destroy whatever independent means of life the worker could garner, from a backyard plot of land, a simple proficiency in the use of tools, a skill that provided shoes, clothing and furnishings for the family, or involved the issue of reducing the proletariat to a condition of total powerlessness in the face of capital. And with that powerlessness came a supineness, a loss of character and community, and a decline in moral fibre that was to make the hereditary English worker one of the most docile members of an exploited class during the past two centuries of European history. The factory system, with its need for a large core of unskilled labour, far from giving the workers greater mobility and occupational flexibility, as Marx and Engels were to claim, actually reduced them to aimless social vagabonds. To reinfuse the artificial crafts with the natural arts is not just a cardinal project for social ecology. It is an ethical enterprise for rehumanizing the psyche and demystifying techne. The rounded person in a rounded society, living a total life rather than a fragmented one, is a precondition for the emergence of individuality and its historic social hallmark, autonomy. This vision, far from denying the need for community, has always presupposed it, but it visualises community as a free community in which interdependence, rather than dependence, or independence, provides the many-sided social ingredients for personality and its development. If we, like Frederick Engels, in contemptuously dismissing German Prodonian demands for workers' gardens as reactionary and atavistic, hypostasize industrial authority, hierarchy, and discipline as an enduring technological desideratum, we do little more than reduce the worker from a human being to a wage labourer and the artificial crafts to a brutalising factory. Here, Marxism articulated the bourgeois project more consistently and with greater clarity than its most blatant liberal apologists. In treating the factory and the technical development as socially autonomous, to use Langdon Winner's excellent term, scientific socialism ignored the role that the factory, with its elaborate hierarchical structure, has played in extending the conditioning of workers to obedience and schooling them in subjugation from childhood through every phase of adult life. By contrast, a radical social ecology not only raises traditional issues, such as the reunion of agriculture with industry, but also questions the very structure of industry itself. It questions the factory conceived as the all-enduring basis for mechanization, and even mechanization conceived as a substitute for the exquisite, biotic, machinery, so-called, that we call food chains and food webs. Today, when the assembly line visibly risks the prospect of collapsing under the mass neurosis of its operatives, the issue of disbanding the factory, indeed of restoring manufacture in its literal sense as a manual art, rather than a muscular mega-machine, has become a priority of enormous social importance. Taxing as our metaphors may be, nature is a biotic industry in its own right. Soil life disassembles, transforms and reassembles all the materials or nutrients that make the existence of terrestrial vegetation possible. 
the immensely complex food webs that supports a blade of grass or a stalk of wheat suggests that biotic processes themselves can replace many strictly mechanical ones. We are already learning to purify polluted water by deploying a bacterial and algal organisms to detoxify the pollutants, and we use aquatic plants and animals to absorb them as nutrients. Relatively closed aquacultural systems and translucent solar tubes have been designed to use fish wastes as nutrients to sustain an elaborate food web of small aquatic plants and animals. The fish, in turn, feed upon the very vegetation which their wastes nourish. Thus, natural toxins are recycled through the food web to ultimately provide nutrients for edible animals. The toxic waste products of fish metabolism are reconverted into the soil for fish food. Even simple mechanical processes that involve physical movement, for instance, air masses circulated by pumps, have their non-mechanical analogue in the convection of air by solar heat. Solar greenhouses adjoined to family structures provide not only warmth but food and also humidity control by vegetation. Small, richly variegated vegetable plots or French intensive gardens not only obviate the need for using industrially produced fertilizers and toxic biocides, they also provide an invaluable and productive rationale for composting domestic kitchen wastes. Nature's proverbial law of return can thus be deployed not only to foster natural fecundity, but also to provide the basis for ecological husbandry. One can cite an almost unending variety of biotic alternatives to the costly and brutalizing mechanical systems that drive modern industry. The problem of replacing the latter by the former is far from insurmountable. Once human imagination is focused upon these problems, human ingenuity is likely to be matched only by nature's fecundity. Certainly, the techniques for turning a multitude of these substitutions into realities are very much at hand. The largest single problem we face, however, is not strictly technical. Indeed, the problem may well be that we regarded these new biotic techniques as mere technologies. What we have not recognised clearly are the social, cultural and ethical conditions that render our biotic substitutes for industrial technologies ecologically and philosophically meaningful. For we must arrest more than just the ravaging and simplification of nature we must also arrest the ravaging and simplification of the human spirit, of human personality, of human community, of humanity's idea of the good and humanity's own fecundity within the natural world. Indeed, we must counteract these trends with a sweeping program of social renewal. Hence, a crucial caveat must be raised. A purely technical orientation toward organic gardening, solar and wind energy devices, aquaculture, holistic health and the like would still retain the incubus of instrumental rationality that threatens our very capacity to develop an ecological sensibility. An environmentalistic technocracy is hierarchy, draped in green garments. Hence, it is all the more insidious because it is camouflaged in the colour of ecology. The most certain test we can devise to distinguish environmental from ecological techniques is not the size, shape or elegance of our tools and machines, but the social ends that they are meant to serve, the ethics and sensibilities by which they are guided and integrated and the institutional challenges and changes they involve.
whether their ends, ethics, sensibilities, and institutions are libertarian or merely logistical, emancipatory or merely pragmatic, communitarian or merely efficient, in some ecological or merely environmental, will directly determine the rationality that underpins the techniques and the intentions guiding their design. Alternative technologies may bring the sun, wind, and the world of vegetation and animals into our lives as participants in a common ecological project of reunion and symbiosis. But the smallness or appropriateness of these technologies does not necessarily remove the possibility that we will keep trying to reduce nature to an object of exploitation. We must resolve the ambiguities of freedom existentially by social principles, institutions, and an ethical commonality that renders freedom and harmony a reality. Chapter 12 An Ecological Society After some ten millennia of very ambiguous social evolution, we must re-enter natural evolution again, not merely to survive the prospects of ecological catastrophe and nuclear immolation, but also to recover our own fecundity in the world of life. I do not mean that we must return to primitive lifeways of our early ancestors, or surrender activity and techne to a pastoral image of passivity and bucolic acquiescence. We slander the natural world when we deny its activity, striving, creativity and development, as well as its subjectivity. Nature is never drugged. Our re-entry into natural evolution is no less a humanization of nature than a naturalization of humanity. The real question is, where have humanity and nature been pitted into antagonism, or simply detached from each other? The history of so-called civilization has been a steady process of estrangement from nature that has increasingly developed into outright antagonism. Today, more than at any time in the past, we have lost sight of the telos that renders us an aspect of nature, not merely in relationship to our own needs and interests, but to the meanings within nature itself. No less strident a German idealist philosopher than Fichte reminded us two centuries ago that humanity is nature rendered self-conscious, as we speak for a fullness of mind that can articulate nature's latent capacity to reflect upon itself, to function within itself as its own corrective and guide. But this notion presupposes that we exist sufficiently within nature and are sufficiently part of nature to function on its behalf. Where Fichte patently erred was in his assumption that a possibility is a fact. We are no more nature rendered self-conscious than we are humanity rendered self-conscious. Reason may give us the capacity to play this role, but we and our society are still totally irrational. Indeed, we are cunningly dangerous to ourselves and all that lives around us. We do not make the implicit meanings in nature explicit, nor do we act upon nature to enhance its inner striving toward greater variety. We have assumed that social development can occur only at the expense of natural development, not that development conceived as wholeness involves society and nature conjointly. In this respect, we have been our own worst enemies, not only objectively, but subjectively as well. 
our mental and later our factual disassociation of society from nature, rests on the barbarous objectification of human beings into means of production and targets of domination. An objectification we have projected upon the entire world of life. To re-enter natural evolution, merely to rescue our hides from ecological catastrophe, would change little, if anything, in our sensibilities and institutions. Nature would still be object, only this time to be feared rather than revered and people would still be objects instrumentally oriented toward the world, only this time cowed rather than arrogant. The camouflage of green would remain, only its tints would be deeper. Nature would remain denatured in our vision, and humanity dehumanized, but rhetoric and palliatives would replace the furnaces of a ruthless industry, and sentimental babble would replace the noise of the assembly line. Let us at least admit, in Voltaire's memorable words, that we cannot drop to the ground on all fours, nor should we do so. We are no less products of natural evolution, because we stand erect on our feet and retain the facility of our minds and fingers, whether we regard this heritage as a boon or as damnation. Nor can we afford to banish the memory that so-called civilization has inscribed on our brains by surrendering our capacity to function self-consciously in society as well as within nature. We would dishonour the countless millions who toiled and perished to provide us with what is worthy in human consociation, not to mention the even larger numbers who were its guileless victims. The soil is no less a cemetery for the innocent dead than it is a source of life. Were we to honour the maxim, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, society would seem to at least be responding to nature's law of return. But society has become so irrational, and its dire to slaughter so massive, that no law, social or ecological, is honoured by any of its enterprises. So let there be no more talk about civilization and its fruits, or about conciliation with the nature of the good of humanity. So-called civilization has rarely considered the good of humanity, much less that of nature. Until we rid ourselves of the cafeteria imagery that we must repay nature for its lunches and snacks, our relationship with the biosphere will still be contractual and bourgeois to its core. We will still be functioning in a sleazy world of cost-effective trade-offs and deals for nature's so-called resources. Only the most spontaneous desire to be natural, that is, to be fecund, creative and intrinsically human, can we now justify our very right to re-enter natural evolution as conscious social beings. Then what does it mean to be intrinsically human, to be natural in more than a colloquial sense? What, after all, is human nature, or is natural about human beings. Here, again, it helps to return to the cradle of social life, the extended development of the young and the mother-child relationship, from which we derived our notions of a libertarian rationality. What emerges from Briffo's account, and, more recently, from the new anthropology that has happily replaced Victorian studies of so-called savage society, is the compelling realisation that what we call human nature is a biologically rooted process of consociation.
a process in which cooperation, mutual support and love are natural as well as cultural attributes. As Briffo emphasizes, quote, In the human group, by the time that one generation has become sexually mature, new generations have been added to the group. The association between the younger generations, pronounced in all primates, is greatly increased as regards solidarity in the human group. From being a transitory association, it tends to become a permanent one. End quote. The prolonged process of physical maturation in the human species turns individual human nature into a biologically constituted form of consociation. Indeed, the formation not only of individuality, but also of personality consists of being actively part of a permanent social group. Society involves, above all, a process of socialising, of discourse, mutual entertainment, joint work, group ceremonies, and the development of common culture. Hence, human nature is formed by the workings of an organic process. Initially, to be sure, it is formed by a continuation of nature's cooperative and associative tendencies into the individual's personal life. Culture may elaborate these tendencies and provide them with qualitatively new traits, such as language, art, and politically constituted institutions, thus producing what could authentically be called a society, not merely a community. But nature does not merely phase into society, much less disappear in it. Nature is there all the time. Without the care, cooperation and love fostered by the mother-child relationship and family relationships, individuality and personality either are impossible or begin to disintegrate. As the modern crisis of the ego so vividly indicates, only when social ties begin to decay without offering any substitutes, do we become acutely aware that individuality involves not a struggle for separation, but a struggle against it, albeit in the pursuit of much richer and universal arenas of consociation than the primal kinship group. Society may create these new arenas and extend them beyond the blood oath, that is, when it does not regress in the form of fascism and Stalinism to the most suffocating attributes of the archaic world. But it does not create the need to be engrouped, to practice care, cooperation and love. To remove any confusion between an organic society, structured around the blood oath and the utopistic vision of a free society advanced in this chapter, I call the latter an ecological society. An ecological society presupposes that the notion of a universal humanitas, which so-called civilization has imparted to us over the past three millennia, has not been lost. It also assumes that the strong emphasis on individual autonomy, which our contemporary so-called modernists so facilely attribute to the Renaissance, will acquire unsurpassed reality. But without the loss of the strong communal ties enjoyed by organic societies in the past, hierarchy, in effect, would be replaced by interdependence and consociation would imply the existence of an organic core that meets the deeply felt biological needs for care, cooperation, security and love. Freedom would no longer be placed in opposition to nature, individuality to society, choice to necessity 
or personality to the needs of social coherence. An ecological society would fully recognize that the human animal is biologically structured to live with its kind and to care for and love its own kind within a broadly and freely defined social group. These human traits would be conceived as not merely attributes of human nature, but also as constituting and forming it. Indeed, as indispensable to the evolution of human subjectivity and personality, such traits would be regarded not simply as survival mechanisms or social features of the biological human community, but as the very materials that enter into the structure of an ecological society.